am uh, chair of the State Bar Association State and Local Government Section Council. And I want to welcome everybody to our annual training event. Uh, we've been doing this for many years, and uh, this is the first time virtual. Um, given the pandemic and the continuing emergency crisis, we had to find a way to make this happen because we were still committed to uh, presenting this annual training. Uh, and we did it. Uh, a lot of people to thank. I certainly want to thank Chuck Thompson, who will be uh, a moderator and actually a speaker today at one of the um, presentations. Uh, I want to thank him for bringing this together and coordinating. Uh, sometimes while he's been coordinating the, um, the IMLA, uh, ICMA overall conference as well. Uh, many thanks, uh, IMLA, I'm sorry. Many thanks to our presenters, uh, including local attorneys, uh, two Maryland Court of Appeals judges, uh, Judges McDonald and Booth, um, and some assistant attorney generals, as well as uh, IMLA staff, and we appreciate that. Many thanks to the State Bar and State Bar staff, including uh, Angela Munro and, uh, and Bill Hall, who's helping us today. And also many, state, uh, many thanks to the uh, Section Council, uh, who supported moving forward with this uh, and making sure we could present it. So uh, we have um, uh, five very good, uh, four, I'm sorry, very good presentations on the Supreme Court, which will be very interesting as soon as I'm finished here with the intro on virtual arguments, which we've all had to face. Uh, and if we haven't, uh, likely we'll be facing uh, discussion on the public lawyer uh, under the rules of professional conduct and then policing in America. Uh, certainly some issues that um, uh, if you're involved at the, at the state or local government level, uh, one way or another, these are all very important issues. So I will now turn it over to Chuck and um, he will begin the moderation of our program. And again, uh, I welcome everybody. Thank you, Frank. And uh, I think the, the uh, best thing for me to do is to introduce our two speakers. They have a lot to say about the Supreme Court. And as we know, the Supreme Court is in a certain element of flux these days. So let me introduce Lisa Sornan, who is the executive director of the State and Local Legal Center, and Amanda Keller, my colleague at uh, IMLA, who heads our legal advocacy program, both of whom work very closely in putting forward amicus briefs to the Supreme Court and uh, Amanda in courts around the country. Ladies. Thanks, Chuck. Um, Lisa, if you wanna just briefly introduce yourself while I go ahead and start sharing my screen here. Are you, are you muted, Lisa? Let's... Yeah, Lisa, just at the bottom of your screen, the mute button. You might have to move your mouse to get it back up. Amanda, maybe you should talk until okay. Lisa's mute button sure. is Sure. Sorry about that. I'm just working on getting my, my screen shared. But um, thank you guys for, for having us here today. Um, as, as Chuck said, I'm Amanda Keller. I'm the uh, Deputy General Counsel for the International Municipal Lawyers Association. Really happy to uh, be here with you guys, uh, here being my office uh, at home uh, in Virginia. Wish we could all be together. But um, why don't we jump right in and hopefully um, uh, Lisa will have her uh, mute worked out when it's when it's her turn, but I'm going to jump in. I'm, I'm, I'm talking first anyways. We have a pretty packed agenda we're going to go over with you all today. Um, we're going to go over some cases from the 2019 term uh, that were relevant to state and local governments. Uh, as Chuck alluded to, we're going to talk about the, the changing makeup of the Supreme Court. So what does it mean that we now have uh, a pretty you know, staunchly conservative 6-3 majority court with the uh, confirmation of Justice Barrett. Briefly talk about the shadow docket as it relates to state and local governments and then preview the 2020 term. So jumping right in, uh, the first case I'm going to talk about is uh, Bostock versus Clayton County. It's a case that was probably on your radar is one of the bigger cases from last term. Uh, the issue in this case was uh, whether the term in Title VII, because of sex, whether that includes uh, protections for individuals uh, based on their sexual orientation and gender identity. 
Uh, the Supreme Court in a 6-3 decision authored by uh, Justice Gorsuch concluded that it did. Uh, and there's a few interesting takeaways from this case uh, that I want to highlight for you all. So first, um, you know, he said that it does include these protections for um, gay, lesbian, transgender employees, because when you fire somebody for uh, those traits, you are doing so for uh, actions you would not have questioned in members of a different sex. So that's kind of the holding. But I think what's more interesting here is is uh, a couple of other uh, issues in the or, or takeaways from the case. So one is something that we know from Title VII, but it was underscored in this case, and that is that um, sex only needs to be one of the but four causes of discrimination. It does not need to be the sole cause. And, and we knew that from prior Supreme Court case law, but it was underscored in this decision. And um, it was certainly one of the things that um, I think the, the litigants were arguing about. Um, and so I think that uh, bears underscoring because it could certainly come up in other contexts, and it has come up in other contexts in the past uh, with, with other uh, Title VII cases. Um, a couple of other interesting things to note about this decision. The, um, the employers had argued for this categorical rule under Title VII saying, you know, we're not violating the statute because we're treating men and women as a category the same. In other words, we're willing to uh, equally discriminate against um, gay men and women who are lesbians, and therefore we are not violating Title VII. Uh, Justice uh, Gorsuch in his uh, majority decision rejected that and underscored the fact that no, Title VII protects people based, uh, it protects individuals, that word is actually in the statute. Um, and so when you are uh, categorically discriminating in this way, you're doubling your exposure. Um, he also noted that this is a very broad piece of civil rights uh, legislation, and there's the whole uh, axiom of uh, elephants hiding in mouse holes. Uh, he said, you know, no, that's not the case here. The elephant was standing before us all along. I'm paraphrasing, but the point being, um, he was saying we shouldn't be surprised that Title VII protects uh, individuals based on their sexual orientation and transgender status because it is such a broad piece of civil rights legislation. And the last thing I want to say about this opinion. Um, is Justice Gorsuch is a textualist. If anybody on the court um, sort of hews to this judicial philosophy, it, it is uh, Justice Gorsuch. And uh, Justice Kagan famously said, uh, either last term or two terms ago, I don't know, Lisa probably remembers, um, we are all textualists now. And so I point this out, if you're curious about textualism, uh, take a look at this opinion because it's really a battle of the textualists. You have Justice Alito in dissent and Justice Gorsuch in, in the majority fighting over who has the better textualist argument of, about what the terms because of sex means. And these are just some quotes from Justice Gorsuch's uh, majority opinion, uh, sort of explaining that philosophy. Um, you know, he says, if the express terms of the statute give us one answer and extra textual considerations such as legislative intent um, give us another, it is no contest. Um, only the written word is the law. And I think for textualists, uh, they, they really are steering clear of things like congressional intent. And so that was one of the arguments the employers were making here. Well, Congress couldn't have intended Title VII to uh, protect, you know, to forbid discrimination based on sexual orientation, transgender status. These weren't things people were thinking about in the 1960s when this was passed. And, and so to a textualist, that doesn't matter. It matters what the statute says. And that kind of brings us back to his point about this being a very broadly written statute. And I point this out for you. Um, because you know, we think about the fact that President Trump has uh, nominated three Supreme Court justices now to the Supreme Court, but he has also uh, nominated many, many, many uh, district court and federal appellate court uh, judges. And I would imagine uh, you, you will have quite a few who also have this similar sort of textualist philosophy. And so in your litigation uh, in, in the federal courts, you may be um, needing to make more textualist arguments now than perhaps you would have been you know, several years ago. And so it's worth sort of understanding this philosophy a little bit better, in my opinion. Um, in terms of implications for local governments, um, obviously in Maryland, you guys already had protections for uh, individuals, uh, employment discrimination for individuals based on their transgender status and sexual orientation. So this isn't a big sea change for you, but I think the next issue, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later, um, is, is gonna be something to watch for. And that's the intersection of the First Amendment with uh, these anti-discrimination laws. And we have a case that's gonna be argued next week, Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, that I'll talk about a little bit later. And so I think that's really uh, where we're gonna have to watch things. Uh, so the next case I wanna talk about from last term is a Clean Water Act case. Uh, Hawaii Wildlife Fund versus County of Maui. And uh, I mostly have this 
slide up here so that we could all picture ourselves on that beach while I'm talking about the Clean Water Act. Um, so you, you don't have to be an environmental lawyer to understand this case. Uh, I found it sort of confusing at first, but um, I, I think you, you can really um, distill it down and, and sort of understand this, uh, particularly when you get to the facts of the case, which I will in a moment. But basically what you need to know is that the Clean Water Act um, requires a permit, a special permit, if you're going to uh, discharge pollutants uh, via point sources into navigable waters. And so point sources are things like pipes and ditches, um, wells, and uh, non-point sources, uh, it's, it, for our purposes of this discussion, is groundwater runoff. Um, so you need the special permit if you are going to be discharging from a, a point source uh, to navigable waters. So what happened in this case was the County of Maui had a wastewater treatment facility uh, where it would uh, take the wastewater, treat it, and then inject it into these underground uh, wells about 80 feet down. The wastewater is uh, indisputably a, a pollutant, so that's not disputed. Uh, the wells are point sources. So what, what would happen here, they did a tracer study, which basically uh, required a hydrologist, I believe, some sort of expert to, to figure this out. But basically, they found out that the wastewater was eventually seeping out of the wells, mixing with groundwater um, un underground, and then flowing to the Pacific Ocean, which is, of course, a navigable water. Um, they had various permits for these wells, but they didn't have this special permit that you need under the Clean Water Act, the NPDES permit. So environmental groups sued, saying they were supposed to have gotten this um, special permit. And the, the question in this case is whether that permit's required when the pollutants start in a point source but are conveyed to navigable waters via a non-point source. The Ninth Circuit said when it's fairly traceable that the, uh, that the pollutants are reaching navigable waters uh, from a point source, if it's fairly traceable, then you do need that, that permit. Um, this is a pretty low standard. It's the, the argument that the environmental groups were making at the Supreme Court. The county wanted a stricter rule basically saying you didn't need a permit if you were discharging into, um, if, if, if uh, it was reaching navigable waters via uh, a non-point source. The Supreme Court basically split the baby um, and rejected these both arguments, kind of found this middle ground and said, you're gonna need a permit when the addition of pollutants through groundwater is the functional equivalent of a direct discharge. So I guess functional equivalent is some a higher standard than fairly traceable. They both are a little bit wishy-washy, but we did get some um, factors to consider here that uh, Justice Breyer uh, provided us in his majority opinion. So we know that time and distance are the most important factors. And he gives a couple of examples in, in the opinion as to, you know, things that are at the outer bounds on both sides. So if you had a pipe that was, you know, discharging onto a beach 10 feet away from the ocean, you know, that that's going to need a permit, uh, you know, on the other side, if it's going to take 60 years to reach um, navigable waters, uh, and I might be getting 60 years wrong, maybe it's 100 years, but he, he gives a couple of, um, you know, very outer bounds sort of examples of when you want, wouldn't need a permit, but everything in the middle is, is a little bit more confusing. He provides some other um, factors to consider, um, which as lawyers, you know, not, we are not chemists or engineers um, or geologists. So what this will tell you is that you're going to need some experts here. So, you know, the nature of material through which the pollutant travels. So that, that to me sounds like you need a geologist. Uh, the extent to which it's diluted or chemically changed. Um, you know, the amount that's reaching the navigable waters, et cetera. So I think the takeaway from this is there's going to be a lot more litigation in the district courts to figure out what these factors all mean. Uh, you're, as I mentioned and alluded, you're going to need probably experts to help you figure out if these permits are required. Um, I'm certainly, as I mentioned, not an environmental lawyer, so I can't tell you if you should just run out and get yourself an NPDES permit, but I understand from folks that uh, they can be expensive and difficult to get, and you might not be able to, you know, kind of do the project in the way that you wanted. So there are reasons, I think, why people don't just run out and get those. Um, Okay, and then the last case I'm gonna talk about before I turn things over to Lisa for, for this segment is the, the Second Amendment case uh, from last term, New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus City of New York. So in this case, uh, New York City had this administrative rule that said if, you, if, you if you're a gun owner, you, you can apply for this premise license and the premise license would allow you to have a, uh, a gun in your home and you could only take it to specific um, shooting ranges located in the city of which I think there were seven. Um, otherwise, you know, that's it. Those are the only places you could take it. 
The challengers wanted to bring their guns to other places, shooting ranges in New Jersey or competitions or second homes, and they, they brought a suit claiming this violated their uh, Second Amendment rights. We have, of course, the only uh, really substantive Supreme Court decision on the Second Amendment ever, which was the, the DC versus Heller case. And all that has really told us is that the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to possess a firearm for the purposes of self-defense in the home. And so everything else has sort of been left up to the lower courts uh, to figure out, you know, how does this apply outside that context? What, what uh, level of scrutiny do we apply to review uh, restrictions on gun ownership, et cetera? So all of that's sort of up for grabs still. Um, the question in this case was whether this ban on transporting handguns to shooting ranges outside, uh, to a home or shooting range outside the city violates the Second Amendment. Once the court granted cert, I think New York City saw the writing on the wall and um, argued that, uh, well, it, it, it amended its, um, its regulation to basically allow these uh, challengers to do exactly what they wanted to do, to bring, to bring their guns to second homes and shooting ranges outside of the city. And then New York State also amended its uh, statute to require localities uh, to allow these licensees to engage in this transport. So, you know, such that New York City wouldn't have just been able to change their law back. Um, so after this, they went up to the court and said, you know, the litigation is now moot. Uh, we'd like you to dismiss the case. Um, the Supreme Court made them go through oral argument, um, but ultimately sided with New York City and did conclude that the case was moot, that, you know, the, the, they were getting the precise relief that the, the challengers wanted uh, by this amended uh, regulation. Justice Alito dissented and had some pretty strong language in here, um, basically saying the court was allowing its docket to be manipulated in a way that shouldn't be countenanced. Um, but I think, you know, this is the dissent, obviously six justices disagreed. And I think it's a pretty interesting, um, you know, maneuver by New York City here. Um, you know, if, even if you just look at statistics, when the Supreme Court grants um, a petition and you were the winner below, odds are that it's going to reverse. I mean, that's not always the case, obviously, but the odds are, are not in your favor at that point. And then, you know, taking account of the fact that you probably had uh, enough votes to strike this down, I think they, they felt they needed to change this. But um, I think it gives some other sort of insight into how local governments might handle a similar situation. And, and obviously what this did was New York City had to change their law, but it prevented the court from having some sort of broad ruling that would have impacted uh, state and local governments all around the country. Um, a lot of people assumed that the court would just take one of the 10 petitions on the Second Amendment that were piling up. And I think Justice Kavanaugh even said that uh, in his uh, one of in his uh, I forget if it was a dissent or a concurrence, but they didn't. And I don't know if Lisa uh, is going to talk about that or not, but it was sort of interesting. And I'll have a little bit more to say about uh, guns in a little bit. So, uh, Lisa, you're up. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk about some cases decided last term, um, but I'm first going to talk about a petition that the Supreme Court did not take, and it's actually really a series of petitions. So, you know, since the beginning of time, um, or at least the 1960s, uh, when qualified immunity became uh, a legal doctrine, the court has gotten multiple petitions, maybe even a hundred, hundreds each year saying that qualified immunity was uh, applied incorrectly in a lower court decision. Um, so that's par for the course. But um, as of a couple of years ago, the Supreme Court started getting petitions asking it to overrule or modify qualified immunity. This became alarming when in last October, the court started holding on to some of these petitions, indicating they might want to do something with them. So IMLA and the SLC worked together to put an amicus brief to defend qualified immunity if that became necessary. So um, all these petitions piling up over nine months culminated in, I guess, nine petitions in May of 2020. And ultimately these petitions were all denied on June 15th of 2020 over Justice Thomas's dissent. And um, you might say, well, why is this such a big deal? The Supreme Court denies petitions all the time. Um, that's true. But there has been a movement, like I said, over the last few years to get something, something done about qualified immunity, if you will. Um, Justice Thomas and Justice Sotomayor have criticized the doctrine, as has, have all kinds of justices throughout for a very, very long time. But they have recently criticized the doctrine for different reasons. 
Um, and lower court judges have criticized it as well. And part of it is come from this a mo a movement by an organization called Cato. I thought Cato stood for something, but it's some minor Greek philosopher. Um, and so this organization uh, a couple years ago uh, started filing amicus briefs in the lower courts, basically saying to the lower courts, ah, this is a close case. Qualified immunity is a bad doctrine, just rule against the police officers. So um, that's, that's the larger context. I'm trying to see if I can move this. Um, that's the larger context for all these petitions piling up. They didn't come from nowhere. They came from a movement involving academics, like I said, Cato, lower court judges. And then happening in the mix was the death of George Floyd. I actually think the court decided before Judge Floyd to deny the petitions and that why we didn't hear right away was that Justice Thomas was writing that dissent, but that's sort of neither here nor there. Um, so we don't really know why the court didn't take um, these cases. The court didn't say. Um, what we do know is, like I said, justices all over the ideological spectrum have criticized the doctrine. There's two theories I've heard for why the court didn't take the cases. One is that um, there are definitely liberal justices on the court that would like to do something with the doctrine, um, but they probably don't have significant support from conservative justices to get rid of the doctrine or even significantly modify it. The other theory is that the justices knew or strongly suspected that Justice Ginsburg's death was imminent and then a new justice would be on the court at some point. And they didn't want to put the new justice under pressure to have to just decide something huge, like getting rid of a legal doctrine. Um, I do want to emphasize the fact that this does not mean by any stretch of the imagination that qualified immunity is safe. There is currently um, a proposal in Congress to get rid of it for police officers. It's gotten through the House. Uh, it won't get through the Senate, probably, un unless and until um, there's a majority of um, Democrats, and even then, I don't, I don't know about with the filibuster if it could get through. Um, but there's also the problem, I guess, as well, of lower courts simply not following the doctrine. Maybe not such a big deal in the Fourth Circuit, but definitely a big deal in the Seventh Circuit. The other thing is lower courts can do things to get around qualified immunity, um, like weakening the Monell doctrine. Um, Amanda and I are currently working on a cert petition right now from a case out of the Seventh Circuit that kind of ignored Monell, if you will, or found an exception to it. Um, so I, I'd say keep an eye on this issue. Um, time will tell whether or not the justices decide to get uh, involved in it. I had initially thought it's over, they're not gonna get involved in it for a long time, but we'll see, I'll talk more about that later. Um, so now back to cases decided last term of interest. So I'm just gonna talk very briefly about the DACA case. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the fact that DACA was, you know, uh, devised by President Obama. It was done administratively. It wasn't done legislatively. And President Trump said, I want to get rid of this program because it's unlawful. So the challenge was under the APA, whether or not it was arbitrary and capricious to want to get rid of DACA because it was unlawful. So to explain what happened in this case is a 5-4 decision written by Chief Justice Roberts where the court found that getting rid of DACA was arbitrary and capricious, but maybe not for the reason that you might think. So you have to think of DACA in two categories. It gave two kinds of rights. One was the right to just sort of live in the United States and not be deported. The other one was the right to work, okay? So when the DACA program was eliminated, both of those rights were gotten rid of. Um, the idea was undocumented people who had the rights before would now be um, deported and could no longer work lawfully in the United States. And what the Chief Justice said basically is that it was arbitrary and capricious. Um, it, it's one thing to get rid of work privileges, but it's another thing to say now we're going to deport these people because administrative agencies have, uh, or I guess you could say DHS has always used some discretion in who gets deported. There's always been priorities. Um, and the court also said that it was arbitrary and capricious not to look at the reliance interest of DACA recipients. So simply say we're getting rid of this program because it's illegal without considering the fact that DACA recipients had uh, reliance interests, interests and without considering the fact that all DACA recipients didn't have to be you know, deported as a result of getting rid of the program. Um, so. Uh, there was a dissent in this case, unsurprisingly. Um, basically, the majority avoided the question altogether about whether DACA is illegal. 
And um, Thomas, Alito, and Gorsuch are like, it's illegal, so why do we care how we got rid of it? Justice Kavanaugh wrote a more sort of neutral um, uh, dissent saying, look, the administration later after the fact gave other reasons for getting rid of DACA, other than the fact that it was allegedly illegal and we should focus on those reasons. Um, so one way of looking at this case is that the Chief Justice sort of saved the DACA program, um, but he didn't go so far as to say it was legal. Um, and the reality is that uh, there's a case in Texas uh, that had been on hold for a while um, where the court had indicated it was likely to rule that DACA was in fact illegal. And I, I'm expecting that ruling at some point in the future. Uh, the other thing too, is there's been a lot of interesting litigation that's filed this decision. Um, specifically, President Trump said immediately after the decision, I'm gonna get rid of DACA. But the reality is it was gonna take him a while to do that. So uh, just a judge in Maryland said, well, until and unless you're able to do that, you need to put the program back in place. So the Trump administration did that, but with some hitches, like it would only it was only giving two one year DACA, um, you know, DACA status. And then it wasn't allowing any new people to apply. Last I heard on this case, um, the one of the parties had filed for uh, sanctions against the United States for not completely allowing DACA to go back into place. So I'm just gonna talk very, very briefly about the Espinoza case. This isn't a case that's particularly significant um, for Maryland on its facts. It's also um, just not a particularly significant case on its facts overall in term, for local governments. Um, but in terms of the bigger law and the trends of where conservative justices are going, it's actually a pretty big case. So the Supreme Court held that if state legislatures want to give kids a voucher to attend religious schools, the free exercise clause requires those vouchers to be provided, even if the state constitution specifically prohibits aid to religion. This again was a 5-4 decision, and Justice Kagan was the only justice that did not write her own dissent. Like I said, not a lot of relevance to this case specifically in Maryland, because you have like a sort of super establishment clause, but it's not a very strong one. And I read online that it hasn't been interpreted very broadly. But the bigger point is this, what most legal you know, Supreme Court watchers say is that the area of the law where conservatives are moving most quickly is religion. And um, so if you put this case kind of in perspective, so from the 50s to let's say like the 2000s, the Supreme Court had said no state aid to religion. But around 2000, the court said, ah, state aid to religion might be permissible. Now the court's saying if state legislatures want it, um, aid to religion is required, uh, which is a really sort of radical shift uh, in, the, in the law. So the last case I'm gonna talk about um, I'm really gonna, not going to talk about the case at all. I'm going to talk about what we tried to accomplish in the case and did and didn't. So the local government law lawyers in particular are very familiar with Reed versus uh, Town of Gilbert. I consider it the most significant case for local governments in the nine years I've worked at the state local legal center. The court held in this case that strict scrutiny applies to content-based restrictions on speech and define content-based really broadly. The problem with this case for local governments and state governments as well is that they're constantly regulating content-based speech. Um, and the Supreme Court has basically said that's a no-no. As a result of the Reed decision, all kinds of state laws and local ordinances have been struck down. Some of them are listed on this screen. So one of the SLC's missions um, is to get rid of the Reed decision. Now you might say this is crazy. I don't disagree with you. The Reed it was 9-0 with concurrences. And it was only decided five years ago. And the concurrences express a lot of skepticism about um, the Reed decision. So that's kind of where we started. So Reed was five years old this term and unsurprisingly, the Supreme Court accepted a case to interpret Reed. It had to do with the anti-robocall law that it had an exception for government debt that was clearly content-based and clearly violated strict scrutiny. That was, was the case it was about, but like I said, it doesn't affect local governments, so I'm not going to go into any, any real detail on it. So the SLC filed a brief asking the court to narrow Reed, but really we're asking the court to overturn Reed. And interestingly, Justice Kavanaugh, in his majority opinion, um, accused Justice Breyer of trying to overread the decision. 
or overturn the decision, which was very exciting for me personally and maybe less exciting for Justice Breyer. Also, interestingly, in the decision, Justice Sotomayor um, didn't say that she wanted to overturn Reed, but she said she would not have applied strict scrutiny in this case, which is not exactly the same thing, but sort of moving in that direction. But here's the most interesting thing. Justice Gorsuch wrote separately, applied strict scrutiny, but didn't cite to Reed. So before Justice Ginsburg died, the word on the street was maybe there's five votes to overturn Reed. Um, then, of course, Justice Ginsburg dies and it becomes a different question. Now the question is, what does Judge Barrett, now Justice Barrett, think of Reed? I'll talk about that in a second. The other reason why this case has gotten a fair amount of attention is that Justice Kavanaugh wrote a severability opinion. I call it a love letter to severability, where he said all the usual things about how great severability is. And the reason why it's so significant and how broad severability is, I should mention. The reason why it's so significant is severability is the big issue in the ACA case, which we won't be talking about, but everyone else is. So I just wanted to mention that um, sort of quickly. All right, now that I found my unmute button, sorry about that. Um, so we want to sort of switch gears here for a moment. Um, you know, what Supreme Court discussion would be complete without uh, talking about the, the fact that we have a new Supreme Court justice on the court as of this week. Uh, and, you know, there's been a lot discussed about the fact that there's now this 6-3 uh, majority conservative court. What does that mean for state and local governments? Um, because it's really sort of a mixed bag when it comes to sort of so-called conservative or liberal justices. There's some issues where um, having a more conservative court is helpful to us. And, you know, I'm thinking traditionally in the areas of, you know, uh, police and qualified immunity, but obviously, as Lisa talked about, that's not necessarily the case when you have somebody like a uh, Justice uh, Thomas on. Um, but then in issues like, you know, land use, that can not be as helpful to local governments when you have a more conservative court. So it's really a mixed bag. It's not it's not uh, very cut and dry. And Lisa's gonna talk about some of the specific issues uh, and how it may uh, affect uh, local governments. And uh, what I wanted to do is just sort of take a step back and talk about uh, Justice Barrett, um, her, her sort of judicial philosophy, which I mentioned textualism uh, when it came to Justice Gorsuch. She considers herself an originalist and a textualist. And I, I have a decision on the second amendment that I think underscores what that sort of originalist philosophy looks like. And again, I think it's sort of helpful for us, for those of you who are litigating uh, in the federal courts to understand these terms, because um, we do have a lot of judges now uh, who have these philosophies. Um, and I'll get to that in a second, but kind of in the bigger picture, we had for a little while, and I forget now if it was just one or two terms, but uh, the chief justice as the swing justice. And, and you know, we had four pretty reliably uh, so-called liberal justices for pretty reliably uh, conservative justices, and then the chief in the middle. And he was able um, to use his swing vote in a way, um, you know, where he could basically decide the outcome of the case and then assign the opinion often to himself and write pretty narrow uh, opinions in cases like DACA or like the census, um, which gave him uh, quite a lot of power. And he's somebody who, um, as has been discussed quite a bit, cares a lot about the the institutional concerns of the Supreme Court, how it's perceived by others. He does not like the idea that, you know, I'm sitting here talking about the sort of liberal justices or the conservative justices, because at the end of the day, he does not want the court to be viewed as a partisan institution. Um, and, uh, you know, rightly so, he has those those concerns. Um, but, you know, what does it mean for him now that there's um, this more 6-3 makeup? You know, I think what it means is, this is just my guess, and I don't know if Lisa disagrees with this or not, but um, I, I would guess he's going to be less inclined to, um, you know, join the Breyer, Kagan, uh, Sotomayor block because uh, obviously he's going to vote um, on issues based on his, what he believes the law is. And, and so that goes without saying, but uh, just in terms of this, um, you know, where he's going to kind of try to sway the court, I would guess he's going to uh, side with the more conservative justices on issues, again, where, where appropriate. Um, based on his uh, belief of the interpretation of the law. But the reason I think that is, you know, he'll still have the ability as the chief to assign the opinion when he's in the majority um, and, and could perhaps move the court a little bit um, more incrementally rather than uh, sort of lurching to the right. 
Um, we're, as Lisa said, we're not going to talk about uh, abortion or the Affordable Care Act. I think there's a lot of press about those issues and what it means for Justice Barrett now to be on the court with that. Um, I did want to talk briefly about the Second Amendment because I had the New York City case on there. I mentioned that there were a lot of petitions that had piled up that the court did not accept, kind of like with qualified immunity. And um, I would not be surprised if this is now again before the court, uh, before too much time goes on. And so where does uh, Justice Barrett sit uh, with regard to the Second Amendment? Um, so she had an interesting case uh, at, at the Seventh Circuit, uh, Cantor versus Barr. And in this case, there was a Wisconsin law, or there's a Wisconsin law that says that if you are a felon, you cannot possess a firearm and it's categorical. And this gentleman, Mr. Cantor had been um, convicted or he pleaded guilty uh, and was convicted of mail fraud. And so he challenged this law uh, saying, you know, he wanted to own a, a firearm and was uh, prohibited from doing so and was under Wisconsin law said it violated the second amendment, a, a two one, uh, panel of the Seventh Circuit uh, upheld the Wisconsin law, but then Judge Barrett dissented. And I think this is where it's sort of interesting looking at what does it mean to be an originalist. Um, so she looked at the history of legislative restrictions on guns at the time um, of founding. And so, you know, what, what did legislatures uh, dis in what circumstances would a legislature disqualify somebody from uh, their right to bear an arm at the time of founding? And she found that, yes, sometimes they did do that, uh, but only when it was necessary to protect the public safety. They wouldn't do it as sort of a categorical ban as Wisconsin did here. So she uh, would have uh, struck down the law in this case. So uh, again, I think it's helpful to look at these um, issues as you're litigating cases with more judges that may have these philosophies, just so you understand uh, what that means. And, and do we now sort of need to become um, scholars of history, perhaps? Um, the other justices on the court have also written uh, about the Second Amendment, in particular, Justice Thomas. And I just have some quotes up here from a couple of dissents from denial of uh, certiorari. Most recently in this uh, Rogers case, which I think was the New Jersey case that the, was pending before the court. So he has basically come out and said he thinks the Second Amendment protects the right to carry in public. Um, I think what's really interesting is when the court eventually does accept a case, you know, there, there's been a lot of discussion, well, is it gonna be an intermediate, intermediate scrutinary type analysis or strict scrutiny analysis? Justice Thomas in the Rogers case said, um, text history and tradition are the dispositive, are dispositive in determining whether a challenge law violates the right to keep and bear arms. And I think um, Judge, when he was a judge, Judge Kavanaugh on the DC circuit said something similar in a dissent. Um, I also think that's the lens through which um, then Judge Barrett was looking at things in that Cantor case. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if this ends up being our sort of test for Second Amendment uh, you know, gun restriction regulation cases. Obviously, that's just a guess, um, and we'll have to wait and see. And there's not even a, a case on the docket yet. Uh, so Lisa, I think this is you. So two things on what Amanda said. A professor from the University of Texas said, gun cases will be like candy to the Supreme Court now. I couldn't agree more. Um, I also think Amanda's right that we're not going to see the chief joining the liberals very often because of that power to assign opinions. And I think Reed is the perfect example of this. There is no justice on the Supreme Court that would have written Reed the way Thomas did. Um, and so take that for what it is. So I'm going to talk more about what Justice Barrett might look like in sort of the regular kind of cases. I mean, the bottom line is that she hasn't been on the Seventh Circuit that long. And the two justices we've, justices we've had most recently um, had long tenures. Justice Gorsuch was on the Tenth Circuit for 10 years. He wrote with a lot of flair. He was always writing about opinions he thought the Supreme Court should overturn. Justice Kavanaugh was on the DC Circuit. He hit every hard issue head on, guns, abortion, the ACA. Um, Justice Barrett comes from a totally different perspective. Um, uh, you know, she, yeah, she has the city of Chicago, so she did get some pretty good cases. But when I looked at her kind of mind run cases, uh, what I saw was someone who knows how to apply precedent and who isn't flashy and interested in drawing. Hey, Lisa, you just muted yourself. You wanna go ahead? Okay, okay. all right. Did you get, okay, I'm trying to. Okay, we can hear you now. Okay. Okay, so qualified immunity. Um, she has one qualified immunity case that got a lot of attention. It involves this guy that was accused of killing his mother. 
And the police officer had all kinds of exonerating evidence um, and just didn't put it in the warning application and asked for qualified immunity saying that it didn't make any difference. And Judge Barrett was kind of like, are you kidding me? And, um, and some people have said, well, that case indicates maybe she wouldn't be knee jerk on qualified immunity. I think what it indicates is that she has common sense and can read the law. Um, but on the other hand, she is a self-described textualist and Justice Thomas has criticized qualified immunity because it's not in the text of the statute because it was you know, invented by the Supreme Court in the 60s. And so it's possible that uh, Justice Barrett could go along this kind of thinking, but remember Gorsuch is an originalist and a textualist as well, and he has not gone along with this thinking to this point. Um, the fact that Justice Barrett never said anything about having these views about qualified immunity on the Seventh Circuit, I wouldn't make much of that. Um, that just, uh, to me, did not appear to be her style. Um, so free speech is an area where the Supreme Court takes a tons of tons of cases. And uh, justice is whether they're conservative or liberal, that, that's not the biggest factor in deciding whether or not they rule against state local government. The, the biggest factor is their Supreme Court justices, so therefore they rule against state and local governments. Um, so just, Judge Barrett did not, when she was Judge Barrett, did not um, participate in many First Amendment cases of interest, but the two that she did, I'm just going to mention sort of briefly, um, you know, they're not radical. They, they're nothing sort of crazy. If anything, I would describe them as not anti-government. So um, Chicago had a bubble zone ordinance, which is basically like you can't go in someone's bubble as they go to an abortion clinic. And they modeled their ordinance around a, a, uh, an ordinance from Colorado that the Supreme Court had 20 years ago said was, was constitutional. But in the meantime, the court had said buffer zones are unconstitutional. So uh, in this opinion, which I don't think Judge Barrett wrote, the court, the Seventh Circuit said, well, you know, um, the court hasn't said bubble zones are unconstitutional, although they have said buffer zones are unconstitutional. So we're going to just kind of leave it at that and say the Chicago ordinance is constitutional. Um, and so, you know, in some ways, like Judge Barrett just did what probably any sort of judge would do. Um, but I could see a Justice Gorsuch sort of saying like, Oh, come on, court, like get on this. Um, but again, I just don't think that that's kind of her worldview. The other interesting free speech case that she had um, involved uh, Illinois stay at home order. So the stay at home order had an exception for churches, like everyone but churches or religious gatherings had to stay at home. And um, basically, the Seventh Circuit, what the argument was well, what about read? Like, this is a content based distinction. Religious people can get together, but no one else can. And the court said, well, you know, Reed didn't discuss religion. It didn't say anything about what to do with the free exercise claim. Again, Judge Barrett didn't write the decision. Um, certainly, the court could have interpreted Reed more broadly, I think, without a doubt. And I think some people would say, well, when Judge Barrett joined her colleagues, she was thinking about her love of religious speech, not her love of government regulation. Who knows, right? Um, but it is kind of an interesting case that she participated in. So her employment record has been cast as um, pro-employer. I would say that's probably about right. What I found most interesting is she had an N-word case. I didn't read the case, but the coverage that I read of it basically said that she said this one instance of using the N-word um, doesn't amount to hostile work environment, um, but maybe one instance, one use of it in another context would, or something to that effect. Judge. Interestingly, Judge Justice Kavanaugh, when he was Judge Kavanaugh, he had one of those cases as well. And he said one use of the N-word in that case could be a hostile work environment. So I, like I said, that case got some attention. It maybe illustrates her being sort of more pro-employer. But again, when I looked at her public employment decisions, she had a lot of Ceballos versus Garcetti decisions. None of them were particularly interesting in terms of a law. I just talk about one here. Um, it was a superintendent who did a forensic audit and uh, a city council member said she was gonna kick this, or uh, I'm sorry, a school member said she was gonna kick the superintendent's you know what. So the superintendent called the police. And then basically they kept the superintendent but they froze her out. They wouldn't, the board wouldn't like interact with her. So she sued for retaliation. And um, the court said, you know, it's gotta be a matter of public concern if two public officials are possibly gonna get into a street fight. So, um, you know, again, just kind of like common sense. 
So I think that, you know, the news media has focused on abortion, ACA, and, and guns. I think those are the, the right places to focus. Um, and that, you know, we're, it's hard. She has such little precedent in the other areas. It's just really hard to say where she's going to come down other than just in general being a conservative. Okay, um, we're going to just briefly touch on the the court's so-called shadow docket, which um, I think has become, you know, mainstream enough. I, one of the senators brought it up during uh, Justice Barrett's confirmation hearings. It's basically uh, a term coined by, I think, Professor Baud. Um, the court certainly does not refer to it this way, where it issues its emergency um, orders, so it stays or its injunctions. Um, and there's a couple of issues on in the sort of COVID order realm that I wanted to touch on. Um, so both of these cases that I have up here on the slide came up to the court on emergency uh, injunctive requests. And so in both cases, it was church churches asking the court to intervene and enjoin a state law that was uh, restricting in-person gatherings uh, such that they argued this was a First Amendment violation in both, both cases. And you can see the dates on here um, uh, for, for both cases. One was out of California, one was out of Nevada. Um, So the, the California case, I'm not going to kind of get into all of this, but there were a couple of uh, quick takeaways. It was a 5-4 decision denying the injunction. Um, Chief Justice Roberts joined the more liberal justices, and he wrote his own statement concurring in the denial of injunctive relief that nobody else joined. Um, but it was, it was interesting because it was giving his sort of reasoning for why he um, denied the injunction in this case. One of the things he said is um, injunctions are basically extraordinary relief. They're only going to be granted um, when the legal rights are indisputably clear. And so he said in this case, that wasn't the case. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight for you with this particular case is just if you have challenges to your um, public health orders, there's some really nice language in here um, that you can pull from about the, the deference that uh, federal courts um, should be giving to uh, these public health officials, uh, particularly in the context of you know, a medically and scientifically fraught area, um, talks about how the, their latitude needs to be especially broad. So um, you can pull this up. Uh, it's a very short opinion for you to take a look at. Um, the Nevada case, the only thing that's sort of interesting here is the court, uh, this was remember in July, also denied the injunction. In this case, um, California was pretty arguably treating secular and non-secular in-person gatherings the same. There were some exemptions for grocery stores in California. Um, Nevada said, okay, in-person gatherings are restricted, but casinos, you know, can go up to 50% of their maximum occupancy, but, you know, everybody else, you can't have more than 50 people. Obviously, there's going to be more than 50 people in a casino if the if the maximum is going to be 50% of their occupancy. So I think arguably they weren't, uh, you know, treating secular and non-secular institutions here the same, but nevertheless, the court denied the injunction. Again, maybe because they're seeking this sort of extraordinary relief. We don't have a statement about why they denied the injunction in this case, but we do have a number of dissents. Um, not going to kind of go through all of these other than to say Justice Alito noted that um, yes, you know, we may give you some deference public health officials um, during a public health emergency, but as time goes on and more scientific evidence becomes available, we're going to expect you to craft more uh, carefully tailored policies uh, accounting for constitutional rights. So, um, you know, I think it's just it's a dissent, you know, it's it's Justice Alito's view, but I think there's there's probably some truth to that, um, you know, especially as the, the COVID public health emergency does continue to uh, drag on. So that's all I'm going to say about the shadow docket, but I know Lisa has a couple of things she wants to share. So you have to just ignore my slides because even though I um, updated them on Monday, they're completely out, out of date. So here's the long and the short of it. During COVID, a number of judges have made changes to election requirements. Probably the most uh, controversial change has been to um, allow absentee ballots to be counted if received after the election day. Until last week, uh, the Supreme Court had basically set, struck down all those judge-made election changes saying judges can't rewrite statutes. Fine. Okay. Last week, uh, the Supreme Court in a 4-4 decision 
allowed um, a Pennsylvania Supreme Court decision to stand, which said um, Pennsylvania can count ballots through November 6th. Okay, so it's 4-4, Chief Justice joined liberals, nobody knew why. Fast forward to this week. There's another decision from the Supreme Court, an emergency motion out of Wisconsin. Wisconsin, a trial judge or district court judge had said, uh, Wisconsin can count ballots received up to six days after the election. 5-3, Supreme Court strikes down this Wisconsin judge-made election change, if you will. What's the difference? Well, we find out. The Chief Justice says um, in that Pennsylvania case, there was no issue of federal law. Uh, the Pennsylvania Constitution very strongly says everyone in Pennsylvania should be able to vote under all circumstances. So the Pennsylvania Supreme Court was merely interpreting Pennsylvania law when it came to this decision. So um, all this to say that what's interesting about the Pennsylvania case is it was only decided as an emergency motion. So the Supreme Court said, on an emergency basis, we're not gonna overturn the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. But the Pennsylvania Republican Party has now gone to the Supreme Court and said, we want you to hear the case on the merits. They haven't decided yet whether or not they will, and they can choose to or choose not to. Um, and of course, Justice Barrett has been asked to recuse herself. And again, she can choose whether she wants to or whether she doesn't. It's also noteworthy that the Supreme Court has another emergency motion in front of it involving judge-made changes to North Carolina's absentee and mail ballot requirements. So that's what's going on in this space. And I'll talk about the implications of it at the end of the presentation, if we have time. Okay, um, so switching gears now and, and kind of previewing the current 2020 term, um, I'm going to talk about a few cases. Uh, I think this is one of the bigger cases. I alluded to it earlier in the presentation when I was talking about the Bostock case. Um, so this is Fulton versus City of Philadelphia. It's it, sort of a reprise of the Masterpiece Cake Shop, if you all remember that from a couple of years ago. So in this case, um, the city of Philadelphia has a contract with a number of foster care agencies, including Catholic Charity Services, uh, in which when a, a child comes into the foster care system, the city uh, refers it to one of these agencies, and then uh, the agency will select a foster parent for the child. So the city learns that two of the agencies, including CSS, um, uh, or CCS, I guess, uh, are, are not going to work with same-sex couples, um, and the city says this violates their anti-discrimination laws. The city goes and talks to uh, Catholic Charity Services, and they confirm that, uh, yes, we, we are not referring uh, children to uh, same-sex uh, couples because that violates our views on, uh, our religious views on marriage. So then the city um, stops referring foster children to them, but they continue to work with them in other capacities. So this goes up to the Third Circuit, the Catholic Charities, um, challenges this as it's a violation of the First Amendment, very similar again to that Masterpiece Cake Shop challenge. Um, the Third Circuit just says, you know, look, under Employment Division versus Smith, all the city is doing is um, telling that, telling Catholic charities that they have to abide by a valid uh, and neutral law of general applicability. Um, there was no evidence in this case of religious bias or hostility, which was ultimately how that Masterpiece Cake Shop case was decided, if you all remember. Um, so the issue in that case was, it was the baker in Colorado who refused to bake a cake for the same-sex couple. Um, they challenged uh, that refusal and claiming it was a violation of Colorado's public accommodation law. And when it went up to the Supreme Court, Justice Kennedy wrote um, for you know something like a seven justice majority, that there was evidence of religious bias by one of the Colorado civil rights uh, commissioners when it was originally before them, um, you know, he had said some negative things about the Baker's religion. So they really kind of punted on the overall First Amendment um, challenge in that case and said, you know, in this case, there's religious bias. So then fast forward to this case, the Third Circuit says, we don't have that same type of evidence here. This is just Employment Division versus Smith. Um, you know, it's it's pretty straightforward. And I'm not going to read you this long quote from the Third Circuit, but I put it in here because they talk about what would happen um, if they were to rule in favor of um, Catholic Charity Services. And 
um, if they were to accept the arguments they are making, and I have this bolded part at the bottom, basically saying that if, if we accept your arguments, then Smith is dead letter and the nation's civil rights laws may as well be in this. So that may be a little bit hyperbolic, but I think um, it sort of foreshadows a bit um, uh, what the issues are before the Supreme Court. And one of them, and this is how they're framed in the petition, is whether Employment Division versus Smith should be revisited, which I think is just a nice way of saying overruled. Um, and the other question that's, and that's of course a really big deal, uh, as I'll get into in a moment, for state and local governments. Um, the other issue is kind of this reprise of the Masterpiece Cake Shop issue. And, and Employment Division versus Smith was not on the table in the, in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. Um, but it's very directly addressed uh, in the briefs in this case. Um, so the other issue is whether the government's gonna uh, violate the First Amendment when it conditions a religious agency's ability to participate, uh, in this case, in the foster care system, on taking actions uh, that contradict the agency's religious beliefs, in this case, on same-sex marriage. So this case is gonna be argued next week. Um, we filed a brief, uh, the State and Local Legal Center in IMLA, uh, that focused solely on this question of Employment Division versus Smith, um, and basically explained um, how problematic this would be for local governments if uh, the court were to overrule the, the case and, and sort of the, the broader context, it's not just about employment law or these con uh, contractor cases, there's a whole host of areas um, that would be uh, impacted if the court were to overrule that decision. Um, and so again, we haven't had oral argument on that, but it's certainly one to watch for. And of course, Justice Sparrow will have uh, be hearing the case because she is now on the on the court. Um, two more uh, quick cases before I turn things over to uh, Lisa. This is a case uh, involving Baltimore. Um, it, it's uh, Baltimore is one of uh, maybe ten or fifteen local governments that have sued oil and gas companies uh, related to uh, climate change uh, litigate, climate change allegations. And basically what they say is these companies are, um, they're, they're creating, they're, they're causing damages to the local governments um, because of climate change. And they have known for decades that their products were causing uh, climate change, but they're denying and downplaying it. So this is very similar to the tobacco litigation, if you all will recall. So this is sort of the underlying what the case is about. Um, and they bring these cases under state common law, uh, public and private nuisance, trespass, it's all state law claims, and they're seeking damages, they're not seeking injunctive relief. Um, they file in state court, the oil and gas companies removed to federal court, and um, they argue that uh, there's preemption issues, there's federal officer removal and a few others, and the federal district court remands back to state court um, denying removal, and then the oil and gas companies appeal to the Fourth Circuit. The Fourth Circuit says, under the sort of congressional, um, un under a congressional act, we can only review the question of federal officer removal um, that we have basically our jurisdiction has been stripped by Congress to review these other uh, issues. And so that brings us to this very wonky federal courts question in this case. Um, and I wanted to give you all that context and background so you understood why it's important. But the question in this case is whether this statute allows uh, an appeals court to review any issue in a district court's remand order, or only, uh, or if it can only review this federal officer removal uh, question. And so the oil and gas companies want uh, the, the appellate court to review all of the reasons for removal, not just federal officer removal. Um, and that's because of these preemption questions. I don't know, you know, I mean, they should be able to argue preemption in state court, um, but nevertheless, they want to be in federal court for various reasons, which I don't fully have time to get into here, but the case is um, ultimately about a, a lot of money. So local governments are claiming that climate change is costing them billions of dollars. Uh, as I mentioned, there's, I think at least 10 or 15 of these lawsuits. Uh, there's also significant federalism concerns. Um, you know, they're, they're bringing these under state law uh, claims and then the oil and gas companies are arguing preemption. So anytime you have sort of a federal preemption issue, I think that's concerning to local governments. Um, Okay, and, and that court that case has not been argued yet. The um, last case I'm going to talk about is the city of Chicago versus Fulton. Um, and just very briefly, um, Chuck did mention at the outset that IMLA files amicus briefs, uh, not only at the Supreme Court merit stage, but we also file them at the petition stage. And we're one of the few organizations um, that will do that. And this was a case that we uh, filed in support of Chicago at the petition stage, the court granted cert, and then we joined the SLC's merits brief. The, the case involves um, the city's practice of impounding, uh, impounding uh, 
people's vehicles after they've accumulated a number of fines and penalties. Um, and what was happening in Chicago was they would impound the vehicles and then the people who own the vehicles would file for bankruptcy and try to get their cars back through the bankruptcy proceedings. The city didn't want to give the vehicles back. Um, what you need to know is that the bankruptcy code has this automatic stay provision, which says as soon as somebody files for bankrupt for bankruptcy, there's a stay on any act to obtain possession or exercise control over it. The city said, we're not acting to obtain possession. We already have possession, so we don't have to give it back. The Seventh Circuit rejected those arguments, said you got to give the cars back. The, the question before the court is that that question of whether passively retaining this property violates the automatic stay provision of the bankruptcy code. Um, the reason we thought this was important is, um, I mean, Justice Gorsuch sort of quipped during oral argument that like, we know Chicago loves to, uh, you know, take everybody's cars, uh, you know, and there's certainly, I think, a lot of public interest groups that would make those arguments. What we were saying is, we think the Seventh Circuit rule is undermining public safety because it doesn't say, you know, yes, sometimes the city is impounding the vehicles based on, you know, parking tickets, a number of them, but it's also impounding these vehicles when somebody's driving under the influence of alcohol um, and other sort of public safety concerns. And there's, there's no, um, uh, in, under the Seventh Circuit rule, you would have to give the car back no matter what. And so we, we were concerned about that. Um, okay, Lisa. So we only have four minutes left. So I'm going to talk about, I'm going to not talk about the cases. I'm trying to scroll through them. I'm going to talk about um, what might happen with the election. Uh, Cause I think that's probably the most interesting thing if you only have three minutes left to talk. Uh, so, I mean, the big question is, is the Supreme Court going to decide the election? And there's basically three theories under which it might or might not as the case may be. Um, but why are we even talking about this? Uh, so in theory, the election might be close. Uh, in reality, from the polls, it looks like it might not be close at all, um, but it could be close. I'm just trying to go backwards here. Um, anyway, uh, but here's sort of an interesting thing. Uh, a couple swing states are not gonna start counting mail ballots or absentee ballots until the day of, meaning that their counts will not be done that night even if they stop accepting um, mail ballots that day. Although that's not true of Florida, they've already started counting. Um, so here are the three theories about how the Supreme Court could get involved in the election. The first one is that the Supreme Court has actually already decided the election. And the Supreme Court has decided it in the Pennsylvania case and in the Wisconsin case and in other cases. And just to sort of make this point more salient, um, Justice Kagan said, you know, if Wisconsin stops counting ballots, on the day of the election, up to 100,000 ballots won't be decided. And remember, Wisconsin last time went to Trump by 23,000 votes. The second theory um, is this, but it doesn't involve the Supreme Court. And the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania case is the perfect illustration of this. We won't have another Bush versus Gore at the Supreme Court. We'll have many Bush versus Gores all over the United States and swing states. And the, the author, the guy who's, this is his theory, what he basically says is, most election law cases, they involve state law. There's no reason for the Supreme Court to get involved in them, see the Pennsylvania case interpreting the Pennsylvania Constitution. So what we could have is disputes in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, but none of them involving federal law, all of them involving an interpretation of state law. So that's a possibility as well. The third possibility is this uh, Electoral Count Act, very complicated. I have um, a long version of the story and a short version of the story, depending on your interest level in this topic. Basically what happens here is that the, the state legislature um, says an election is a failure and then the state legislature gets to reappoint, um, gets to reappoint um, electors and that, that and those electors then determine who wins the election in the state. There's some questions about whether this um, is even constitutional, this electoral count act, but anyway, that's a third sort of theory. In the confirmation hearings, Justice Barrett did not indicate whether or not she would recuse herself. And um, the theory is if she did recuse herself, probably Justice Roberts would join the liberals. Um, if she didn't recuse herself, she, she would, he would probably join the conservatives. So I asked to give her some cover. And with that, I am done. And it is still 1029. It is, good job, Lisa. Uh, and great job, Amanda, both of you. I thought, uh, I, and I, I thought you both did a terrific job. I'm sure 
that our audience did as well. I want to thank you very much for participating in our program, and I hope that we'll be able to do it again next year. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. We're going to take a 30-minute break. Uh, one of the things we learned in doing these Zoom uh, sessions was that people didn't want to sit in front of their computers all day and uh, needed a break to check emails, do a little bit of uh, work. And that's what we're going to try to do now. We'll see you back at uh, 11 a.m. for another terrific program on virtual arguments, which to some extent, I suppose this was. See you back at 11. Thank you.
You are now live. Hello. Welcome, everyone. This is Chuck Thompson, and I'm the moderator And uh, for today's session. I want to thank you all for being here. I, I want to introduce you to a terrific program on virtual arguments. We have Brenya Booth, uh, Ju Honorable Brenya Booth, uh, Judge of the Maryland Court of Appeals, Brenda Gruce, who's an Assistant Attorney General, and Lynn Board, who's the City Attorney for Gaithersburg. I'm going to not spend any time on further introductions because there's a lot to be covered and a lot to be said. So I'm going to turn it over to Brynja Booth, uh, Honorable Brynja Booth, excuse me, and uh, Brenda Gruce. Go ahead, take it from there. Good morning, everyone. Um, just to kind of lay out the uh, format for the next hour, uh, Brenda and I are going to talk about appellate advocacy, um, primarily focusing on the Maryland Court of Special Appeals and Court of Appeals um, in kind of a dialogue format. And then Lynn is going to talk about administrative um, uh, virtual presentations in the second half. Um, so part of when we were preparing this yesterday, we realized in my discussions with Brenda, a lot of the things that maybe we were talking about in March or April as we were getting set up to uh, learn this new technology, um, you already know. For instance, you're here and you're on a Zoom presentation, so presumably you know how to use Zoom and um, you know what, what the capabilities are. You've seen a, a PowerPoint this morning. Um, so a lot of those technical issues, if you will, have been kind of worked out. I know when, when the court first uh, undertook this new technology, there were a lot of questions as far as which platform, security issues, how it was going to work, making sure that all of the judges knew how to use it. We actually um, were concerned at the judiciary with um, um, security issues. You don't want obviously somebody to photobomb the uh, appellate arguments at the Maryland um, Supreme Court. And so we, we've worked through a lot of that. And I think the courts and particularly the, the clerk's office has gotten really good at this. So um, hopefully we can give you some insights on appellate advocacy and, and the, the what to do and what to don't, or what don't, what not, not to do. But uh, at least, um, you know, the technology is here. And I think what we'll show during our discussion is it's probably not going anywhere um, anytime soon. And, and you, you will likely see it continue in some way, or way shape or form um, indefinitely. So um, with that, um, you know, one of the things I was, I was thinking through as we were preparing this presentation is um, what the differences are. And, and, and obviously when you're getting ready to go to a, an argument, if, if you'd never been to the Court of Special Appeals or Court of Appeals before, you would research the parking, you'd check in with the clerk's office, you'd figure out how long, long it, it took to get there. And what you would realize is that um, the preparation for um, getting to the argument and making the argument successful is as important as the uh, argument itself. So we thought we'd start out with kind of the discussion about preparing for the oral argument. And I know that Brenda had um, at least one, if not maybe several arguments before the Court of Appeals. I know you had one, Brenda, uh, in September. So maybe just discuss uh, what you've done and what, what the um, Attorney General's office routinely does to get ready for these arguments. So apparently the surgeons have a saying that you watch one, you do one, and then you teach one. So I've had two <laughs> CSA arguments and one in the Court of Appeals. And um, basically what our office has done is move the preparation process uh, virtual. So we've always done moot courts. We have a huge room with a beautiful view on the 17th floor uh, in downtown Baltimore. And we usually set up there and three of us play the judges and one of us stands at a podium and does her argument. So we now do that over Zoom. Um, before we uh, appear virtually in the Court of Appeals. We do that for Court of Appeals arguments. For Court of Special Appeals arguments, we, do, we don't do that unless it's a really important argument. Um, I think uh, your discussion about the, a lot of the preparation is before you get to the courtroom. That is one of the things that obviously is a change. The clerk's office, as you mentioned, is amazing and they run a 
pre-argument run-through, which um, I think it would be almost malpractice not to attend because they explain everything about how to do it. Um, I found it um, interesting that even though I, I live about an hour from the courthouse and I don't like the process of getting there, but I did have my routine, you know, going the parking, the rushing to the courthouse. Um, if my arguments are later in the day, I actually sneak out to next door to get coffee because there's no coffee in the courthouse. So um, I realized, you know, now I have my routine with the Zoom, um, which involves checking in and having coffee in my kitchen. Um, so, but having ritual, doing the way, doing it always the same way, I think makes for a calmer, better argument. So it took, you know, now with three, I feel like I have my home ritual too. Um, I think the biggest change for us is sitting down rather than standing up. I know we have the option to stand up, but I have watched arguments where, and I'm curious what Judge Booth says about this. I've watched arguments where folks are standing up and I feel like when you're in a little space, if you're walking around and you're waving your hands, it just doesn't work well. And I was very nervous about as an advocate making the transition. And what I convinced myself is that, yes, we have these new courts in the nice new courtroom in our building, but a lot of the time we're talking about our cases over the phone. And sometimes I'll say at the end of a phone conversation with my colleague, thank you for mooting me. So what I thought about is if I can talk about my issues on the phone, I can sit in front of the camera and I can do it. Um, for me, curiously, uh, I sit with my hands clasped and um, in the courtroom, I once, uh, attended a dinner with Judge Kehoe where he said one of his pet peeves is he doesn't like, I don't have my prop, he doesn't like people uh, who wave pens. So I'm always very careful to put my pen down, but I've watched myself and I know I still use my hands. And for some reason sitting down, I don't do that. And I think having watched some arguments online that when you're arguing for Zoom, and I, again, I'm curious what Judge Booth has to say, the, the stiller you are, the better. Um, one of my colleagues said one of the reasons she doesn't like the Zoom arguments is that she thinks she's very vehement and in your face, and she said it just doesn't look good on the Zoom. She wants to be in the courtroom because the distance somehow um, uh, mili uh, ameliorates that, that affect, which could be aggressive, but in the courtroom it looks just more, you know, appropriately zealous. Looks like I was I would I was muted. One of the um, the things we'll talk about is the the preference for muting yourself when you're not talking. Um, yeah, so I've seen the arguments both ways with people standing and sitting, and it definitely takes some getting used to. I I would never tell you know I want I want the um, litigant to do what's comfortable, and I've seen some effective presentations where they're standing. But I almost think this um, setting lends itself to sitting. And, and what I would say is, is, as long as we're doing the, the Zoom arguments, do what makes you comfortable. Um, you, you do have to get used to seeing yourself talking when you're, when you're arguing or even when I'm asking questions from the bench, it's, it's kind of like you're preparing looking in the mirror. <laughs> so there's a lot of adjustments that need to be made. Um, but what I find from, from the bench perspective is that I have a lot of room to, to spread out. And so I have a, actually a nine or 12 foot table here. And, and I feel like I actually have the benefit of having more books, research, research briefs. And it actually makes in some respects, the arguments easier because I have everything at my fingertips. And from the litigants perspective, I would, I would think the same applies. Rather than standing at a small podium where you are worried about your hand movements, you can sit. Your hands are, you know, placed comfortably on the on the desk, and you also um, perhaps have more space available uh, to spread out. Have have your resources. They don't necessarily have to be on the camera, but um, if I were a litigant, I would certainly take advantage of the informal. Um, setting and, and, and utilize it as best you can to, to make an effective presentation. 
I think that really depends on your space. Um, in my house, I considered where to set up and um, I'm actually in my kitchen. Usually behind me is a bulletin board that I take down for the argument, but um, I'm sitting at the head of my kitchen table. If I, if I spread out the way Judge Booth is saying, I would have the windows in back of me and it wouldn't look good. So I end up having to put my papers on this kitchen chair that's next to me. Um, so I find that it's less, it's not as comfortable as in the courtroom, but that's just something you have to think about when, when you set up. Um, the other thing that I was told was you need to position the camera at eye level. So my, um, I have a Mac laptop, it's sitting on top of the Random House English Dictionary, but I feel like if I used a binder for oral argument, which I don't, there wouldn't, I would be very cramped. Fortunately, even in the courtroom, I just use loose sheets of paper. I try to come in with only one or two sheets. And so I put them in front of me. Um, but I think, again, the setup, it could be better. It could be worse. It depends if, if, if this is at home. Um, it depends what your, your home looks like. And uh, I think going forward, people are going, there was just an article last Friday in the Wall Street Journal about uh, their, their housing real estate section about how homes now are being designed, not only to have home offices, but home studios. And, uh, you know, I, I just have a feeling that, um, you know, when I talk to my grandchildren about how, what the pandemic into which they were born was like, and I talk to them about my oral arguments, they're gonna look at me like I was nuts. Like, were you really arguing in a kitchen? And I will say, yes. <laughs> And, and I do think, you know, we're all dealing with the fact that in, in most instances we're, we're um, having arguments from home. You may even see judges having, having their arguments from home. And I think that your surroundings are important in the placement of the camera. Um, I recall an instance where a woman was balancing the laptop on her, her lap and the, the, the camera was angled at her face in an awkward way. And maybe that was the only space she had, but to the, to the extent that you can find a good spot um, and it doesn't have to be fancy, um, your kitchen looks great. Um, it, I'm glad you took your bulletin board down because I might sit and look at your bulletin board in, instead of you. And some of the things that seem obvious, I've, I've mentioned uh, to people when they've asked me, what should I do? Um, and I, these are not examples from our court, but they are real examples. If you wouldn't wear your pajama pants to court, don't wear them on the oral argument. You might have to get up for some reason. Um, if you wouldn't take your stuffed animals to court, maybe don't have them lined up in the in the back of your kitchen. Um, judges can be distracted by their surroundings. Litigants can, and uh, it just your your the arguments are being archived and for posterity. And um, you probably. Uh, Brenda, don't want to explain to your grandchildren why you had uh, you, you were doing an oral argument at the Court of Appeals in your pajamas with your stuffed animals. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it it is important. I try to um, my ritual is the same when I'm going to do a Zoom argument as as it would be in court. Um, actually, I like to I like the Buffalo Bills, and I tend to drink out of my my Buffalo Bills mug. But I wouldn't take it on the bench, and I wouldn't sit from it during arguments. Um, I I turn off my um, Apple Watch. I silence it. I silence all my phones. I make sure that everything's on silent, so that if um, if I'm not on mute, if I'm asking a question, um, everybody can't hear all of the background. Uh, I, I turn off my outlook so that I'm not getting email pings during the arguments. So I, I prepare just as I would to go out on the bench as I, as I would when I'm at the, at the Zoom. So I have a question for you. We, we uh, both of us read a um, very long uh, explanation memorandum from the um, American Academy of Appellate Lawyers about doing video arguments. And um, some of the things they talked about were the very technical things like, does your room have curtains and carpeting? Cause that will make your voice seem better and the lighting and so on. And um, the question that's always asked of appellate 
uh, judges is how much of a difference does oral argument make anyway? And usually the answer is, well, not that much, but sometimes in some cases. So I'm curious, how much of a difference does the technical uh, aspect of the video, whether the sound is good or the lighting, how much of a difference does that really, really make? Because at the end of the day, my feeling is that everyone has their own style um, and these things get filtered out um, so that you are really just concentrating on the questions and answers and, and the rest is uh, somehow the human brain is able to filter it. So I would say at the end of the day, none of it matters. Um, and I don't necessarily care whether you're sitting in front of a window and your face is, is, is in the shadows. Um, as long as we can understand the argument, we don't really care about the background. It's more of a, you know, it, it's, it's professional. Your, your background right now is professional. Um, we understand that people are doing these from their kitchens or if they're even in a, a studio apartment, they may be doing it from their bedroom. Um, and it really doesn't have an impact on the arguments. What is probably, it's it's more, I'm, I'm looking at it from the litigant side. Um, I would be nervous if I were on a Wi-Fi connection, let's say, and there was a disruption in my argument. It would cause me to to be more nervous and I might, my argument may not flow. So I think you want to set yourself up for the best argument you can. But um, as long as you're, you're there and you're presenting your argument, probably all, all of that other stuff doesn't matter. Um, and I will say my personal feeling is I think arguments do matter. I think there are times where members of the court have questions um, in their own minds and the argument may, may, um, may very well uh, influence the thinking or the outcome. So I, I do think they're important. And um, I think this format does work. Um, I have found that the arguments have been very good. And um, so, so yeah, I think I, I wouldn't necessarily uh, wave, wave oral arguments because you don't want to appear on Zoom or you're concerned about your background um, because at the end of the day, it, it really doesn't matter. So I'm gonna ask a question that we didn't talk about yesterday. And if it's not appropriate, please say so. <laughs> but, um, how does being virtual affect the interaction among the judges on the court, both during the argument? And actually there, I, I do have observations in terms of how you get your questions in, but also in terms of talking about the case um, in, in afterwards. So I'm sure it's it's similar to uh, people who are in private practice or in government as far as um, I was actually just talking with Judge McDonald, my colleague in the breakout room about the pros and cons of this pandemic as far as work setting. And I think um, as a judge, I'm far more productive not having to, to drive to Annapolis, um, but you, you do miss, it's isolating and you do miss the camaraderie um, in the, inner, the exchange. Um, as far as the arguments themselves, it, it did take some getting used to. One of the things I can't tell if the audience can see, but without the mute button on, you and I, it's like the Hollywood Squares, and I'm probably dating myself here a little bit. I don't think Hollywood Squares is on anymore, but um, I can tell when you're getting ready to talk because the yellow box um, around outline comes on. And so I, I think as a court, we've gotten used to um, the um, our, our, our body language over Zoom. I know it was difficult for me, and I'll put Judge McDonald, if he's on the spot, um, <laughs> <laughs> if he's on, if he's listening on the spot, I used to be able to look down the bench and I could tell from body language. I could tell if Judge McDonald was leaning in, he was going to ask a question. And so you lose that and, and you are nervous about um, talking over uh, each other. So there's definitely something lost. My, my clear preference would be that if we could go back tomorrow, I would much rather have these in person. Um, and, but I, but I think the court like everyone else is doing the best they, they can. Um, we maintain that um, discourse, camaraderie, um, as much we can over, over Zoom calls and, and private conferences, but, but it isn't the same um, for sure. Mm -hmm. And the arguments take getting used to. 
do you feel in general like the bench is somewhat colder as a result of doing it on Zoom? I don't get that sense. I'd be interested what people thought if they'd watched our arguments. Mm -hmm. I, I certainly don't hold back from asking questions. Um, there may be times where I actually feel like I'm asking too many, so I hold back to make sure no other members of the court have questions. But I, I don't feel like we've gotten more quiet as a group because we're on uh, Zoom. I figure out where I have questions and, and want answers prior to arguments, and I go ahead and ask those questions. So let me ask you, do you feel like our bench has gotten more quiet? I don't feel like I have enough experience. <laughs> um, the, the one argument I did before you, I did feel that way. And then I watched um, Jerry Welter's argument in the Fourth Amendment case having to do with the light rail and people were asking questions all the time. So um, I, I think maybe if at first it, it was, as you said, you have to learn how to do it. Um, in the Court of Special Appeals, where there are only three judges, and um, I think in general, one judge tends to be more active. Um, sometimes I have felt like it's a one-on-one -on -one with the judge that is asking questions, but that's a good thing. I mean, they teach you in law school, you're supposed to have a conversation in the oral argument, so it feels like a conversation. Um, so you mentioned if we could go back tomorrow, you'd go back. Is, is that an unequivocal um, thought that we should just abandon this format once there's, uh, uh, we get through the pandemic? So I, you know, I think that this technology is here to stay. Um, as far as when I prepared for this today, I, 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 I reached out to the Court of Special Appeals to see what, what, what they were doing. And um, it, it seems that everyone is dealing with this on a month to month basis. In talking to uh, Greg Hilton, the clerk of the Court of Special Appeals, he said there may be um, instances where it will depend at the Court of Special Appeals on the panel. Um, the judge's comfort level, the litigant's comfort level. It could be situations where there's a hybrid. Um, we had a, a case at the Court of Appeals last month where somebody was arguing from Seattle. You know, maybe the court, and, and I don't know, is, is more willing to consider those types of issues. Um, I think the days of having a snow delay and court being canceled or, or fog on the bridge where uh, you, you delay the arguments are probably... Uh, no longer a thing. Maybe we'll be telling our grandchildren when life used to uh, close down because of weather um, someday. So I, I think that it's, it's here to stay in some fashion. I know all of the members of our court, if they could, would, would like to go back to the courtroom um, because of the camaraderie, the, the, just the nature of the proceeding. Uh, we, we did look at whether there were ways we could, you know, with jury up, how, how do the appellate courts deal with this? And I think what, what we've concluded is it's difficult um, because of the social distancing for, for seven of us to sit on the bench. And with masks, if I'm doing a Zoom argument like this, it's very hard to understand what I'm saying. And because these are, you know, um, they're archived, people watch these live stream, they were watching them live stream before the pandemic, I think it would be difficult for the court to go back to that setting effectively um, until this kind of subsides a little bit. But but I think, I so I guess to answer your question, a, a long way of answering your question, I think that we will go back to normal, but I think there will be instances where this technology proves to be useful in the future. So I wanna make sure we leave some time for Lynn. Chuck, you're coming on, are you telling us we should uh, no, I was just uh, I was just coming on to, uh, a little bit ahead of time to uh, say that you know why, why don't you go ahead, Brenda, and and uh, wrap this piece up. But we'll probably have some some more discussion after Lynn talks. So one of the things that um, I know Lynn will talk about some, and and I'm curious to see is that it, it strikes me that what one advantage of the virtual argument is in cases where there is an issue about physical evidence and exhibit that it will be easier to present virtually than 
um, in person. My first experience with, with a demonstrative tool was in a case involving Twitter messages. And a couple of days before the argument, it, saw, it occurred to me that I really wanted to show the judges the, the messages and point things out. And it was too, I didn't have enough time to consult. It turns out we have someone in the office who does exhibits and I could have blown it up, but I came into court with eight by 11 pieces of paper and tried to show them to the, the bench. And uh, it didn't, it, it worked better than if I hadn't had them, but it didn't work super well. Um, so I had done, I, I did a subsequent argument, not in, in the Court of Special Appeals, where I brought in a huge phone core exhibit. But again, it was very hard to see. And I think that in a virtual argument, one of the advantages um, would be able, uh, would be to be, to be able to use um, exhibits more effectively than we can uh, now. Of course, I think in our cases, there's probably a very small fraction of cases that it, we're, we're looking at the actual evidence is important in an appellate argument. But um, it just strikes me that there's, there's techniques to exploit that we don't know yet, but that could be um, used in a um, virtual argument that you can't do in person. Judge, how do you uh, think the court would feel about uh, people using some of the screen shares and techniques to bring uh, parts of the record before the court that really you can't do very well in the courtroom itself. I think as long as it's in the record, um, that would be useful. And I, I can recall a couple of cases from last term where people had giant poster boards mounted and, and it's difficult for opposing counsel to see or parts of the bench. So to the extent it's actually, you know, a key crucial piece of evidence in, in, in a case that we're considering, I, I think that uh, Brenda's right, it, this, this technology lends itself to that type of format. The other thing I would do um, in an argument, if, if it was uh, virtual and, and relevant to the argument, is sometimes we're reading from the transcript, um, reciting the jury instruction, for example. So um, I think rather than say to the judges, I'm now going to read the jury instruction on intent, it's at E132, and then they all start uh, fumbling with their extracts. I could put it on the screen and have it on the screen as I'm reading it. It strikes me that that would be an effective way to present the argument um, because a lot of times when that happens, um, you have the feeling that uh, the judges are still looking for the instruction while you're reading it. So I think there's, there's pros and cons. I think in the end, we're human beings and, and Judge Booth is right. We'd rather all be in the same place at the same time, face to face. And, and hopefully one day we will uh, be there again. Well, let me turn to Lynn now, but uh, while Lynn is speaking, I'd like you all both to think a little bit about some of the tech, technical issues that you may have experienced that uh, other practitioners uh, might be able to learn from. For example, neither of you are using a microphone like I have, uh, and I'm not sure what bandwidth you have and how much bandwidth someone needs to, uh, to avoid having some uh, web difficulties or internet difficulties as part of the pro process. So a couple of little technical things, but Lynn, why don't we run to you quickly and uh, hear what it's like to make virtual arguments at administrative hearings. If uh, we got you, okay, great. All right, thank you, Chuck. Um, I did wanna follow up on two things that um, Brenda and Renya mentioned. Um, and this comes really from my experience of handling a couple of administrative appeals before circuit court judges. Um, one, I think Brenya mentioned, you know, the importance of, you know, making sure you have a good Wi-Fi connection um, versus, you know, if you're using a laptop or in my case, I'm currently using an iPad. Um, the other important thing, only because this happened to me during a circuit court argument, is make sure you have a charger handy. Um, I had a circuit court case that was scheduled to go for an hour and ended up going three and a half hours. And that day I had decided to, to do the argument in my office versus my house, mostly because I have two dogs that can sometimes be disruptive. Um, and I realized I'd forgotten my charger. 
And about three hours into the argument, you know, I get the little notice, you know, you have 10% battery life left. And I'm frantically texting anybody in the, uh, the office, which was pretty vacant, you know, does anybody have a charger? And, and luckily Frank Johnson had one and came to my rescue and provided a charger. But, you know, the little things you don't really think about of, you know, you don't want to cut out in the middle of your argument and then try to explain to the judge why you don't have a, have a connection. Um, the other thing I wanted to follow up was, you know, really kind of the uh, exhibits and um, screen share options. And again, this came out of a circuit court argument on an administrative appeal. In that case, um, we did have a pre-meeting with the judge in the chambers to kind of organize how we were going to handle uh, the, the hearing. Um, and it was pretty early on. So I think we were all just trying to figure out what to do at that point. Um, the judge did require us to identify any exhibits that we were going to reference. Um, we had a record of several thousand pages in this case. Um, and then we did, uh, all the counsel to the case did put together a separate document that just included those exhibits. Um, and then the, actually the, the clerk's office operated the screen share so that when anyone referenced any of those documents, you had to specifically reference, you know, document page number or whatever, and the, the clerk itself would pull that, pick, that particular exhibit up. And that did help because again, instead of, you know, fumbling through a 3000 page, you know, transcript from the, the lower proceedings, it was easier for everyone to make sure that we were all looking at the same thing and had access to the same documents. So I think that that's really a very helpful, um, practice. But I'm going to really turn to um, virtual arguments before local administrative bodies. And really, these are proceedings before bodies such as a planning commission, a board of appeals, landlord tenant commission, you know, animal control board, or any other local government quasi judicial board or commission. And um, there are really some unique issues in these types of cases, both from the view of the government attorney who's responsible for advising the the border commission, and also the attorney representing the party in these types of proceedings. Um, so much of the advice that you've already heard today from uh, Judge Booth and Ms. Gress are, you know, equally important here. You know, obviously be cognizant of, you know, your background. Um, for me, that my dogs aren't barking like throughout the entire proceeding, you know, those types of issues. So, but we've already kind of covered those, but there are some particular issues that you need to be a little bit more cognizant in these types of cases. Um, mostly the issue is most of the members of these boards and commissions are volunteers and they all have various degrees of experience with technology or even whether they possess the technology and they're home to participate in these types of meetings. So again, this is a proceeding that as a result, it's really important to have that kind of advanced planning and testing prior to the, the hearing itself. So if you're representing the administrative agency, some of the things that you may wanna consider is um, one, you know, do your commission members, your board or commission members have the technology they need to participate in the hearing? Um, for example, in Gaithersburg, our chairman of our board of supervisors of elections, who's been chair for 30 some years, does not have a computer. She does not own a computer and she has a flip phone. Um, you know, so the agents, you know, the, the city does have to provide her with the technology in order for her to be able to attend these meetings and participate in these meetings. And a lot of times it's, you know, training for some of these people as well, because, you know, as we as lawyers are learning this technology, um, you know, people who are not familiar with using it, you know, have those same types of difficulties. You know, the other thing that's important is you want to make sure you have familiarity with the particular technology because, you know, I think a lot of us have gotten very used to Zoom and maybe go to meetings, but there are a lot of different platforms out there and everybody uses something different. Um, you know, for example, my, the, um, the Montgomery County Circuit Court case I, I referenced, again, this was very early on and they used a technology called Blue Jeans, which I'd never heard of, never had used. Um, I talked to my IT department, they had never heard of it either. Um, I think the Montgomery County has since changed and they are now using Zoom, but, you know, so it was very important to go in and make sure you had downloaded, you know, that particular app, had kind of played around in a little bit so you knew what, you know, obviously where the mute button was, where the video button was, um, share documents, those types of things. 
Um, so again, that kind of test testing prior to the hearing is very, very important. Now, the other issue is sometimes the participants in these meetings are not represented by counsel. And they also have, you know, a varying degree of experience with using the technology. Um, so it's important to make sure that one, your clerk or whoever is setting up the meeting has contact information for all these people. You need to know who all the witnesses are gonna be, the parties, the witnesses, you know, obviously you need name, address, um, telephone number, email address, uh, so you can set up appropriate tests to make sure that they can participate appropriately. The other thing that we can't really forget in these cases is that these are still proceedings that are subject to the Open Meetings Act. So you still have to have an, you know, post an agenda um, notice of the meeting. Um, that notice does need to include information as to how people can participate. So, um, you know, if it's gonna be available via, via Zoom or some other method, you know, your notice really should state you know, how people can connect to, you know, to have the link uh, to the meeting. Um, and, you know, in Gaithersburg, we also provide access via telephone because we know not everybody has computers. So, you know, that all that information needs to be, you know, on your notice. Otherwise people can claim that they didn't have true access uh, to view the proceedings of the border or commission. Um, the other interesting component is, you know, while these have to be open to the public so people can view the meeting, it doesn't mean they get to participate in the meeting. So, you know, every member of the public who wants to view these proceedings does not have the opportunity to participate. So you need to check with your, your IT staff or your clerk to see if you can control that particular function because you don't want, you know, kind of the random residents starting to spout off during the middle of you know, this administrative proceeding to whatever their views may or may not be, however relevant they are in the case. Um, so, you know, again, we have set up a system where, you know, people can view, but they can't participate unless they're specifically invited to participate. So you need to kind of think through these issues before the proceeding uh, to make sure that everything is, is covered. Um, you can also require advance registration for individuals who do want to participate. You know, particularly if there's a public hearing component, um, you can require people to sign up in advance and then that way obviously you can test you know, their system. And then also when the appropriate time comes, you can invite them to participate um, in, in the meeting. Um, it's also important that these meetings do these administrative hearings do need to be recorded? People kind of forget that, but you know they are appealable to the circuit court through an administrative appeal. So you have to make sure that whatever technology you're using does record the proceedings. So you know eventually a transcript of the proceedings can be prepared if needed on um, on appeal. So we've talked a little bit about documents, but I want to kind of focus on that again. It, I think it's really helpful to um, you know have documents numbered or referenced in some type of way. Uh, for most administrative proceedings, there is an agenda packet that's prepared um, that would have um, numbered documents. So if you're presenting before one of these agencies, it's helpful if you can, you know, if you're referencing a particular document that you would say, you know, agenda packet page 26, um, it was a copy of the site plan, or, you know, whatever the particular document may be. Uh, but that way, I think it, it's very helpful to, for all the participants and the board members to kind of all be on the same page and make sure that everybody's referencing the same thing. Um, and if there is going to be a shared screen function, it's important to work out the details of that prior to the meeting. Um, I've seen some agencies where, you know, the participants are able to pull up you know, the shared screen document that they wanna use. Others prefer the clerk to do that. So, you know, again, the clerk would need to have copies of all of those documents, know which document you're referring to, but it's important again, to kind of work out those, proceed those processes before the hearing versus kind of in the middle of the hearing of somebody trying to fumble of, you know, one, do I know how to use shared screen? Um, and then, you know, two, who's, who's gonna be actually, you know, pulling up the document for the, for the shared screen. Um, the chair's role in these 
proceedings is also a little bit different and pro probably like uh, as uh, Judge Booth mentioned, you know, it's a little bit different for, you know, the judges on the court as to how you approach these, uh, the, these proceedings. But I think it, it's really important to sit down with the chair of your board of commission before the hearing to kind of go through the processes and how it's gonna be different, you know, in, the, in a virtual meeting versus an in-person meeting. Um, the chair should be prepared to, at the beginning of the meeting, really state the rules and the, the proceedings of, of who can talk and when they can talk. Um, there needs to be some agreement as to how people are recognized. Um, you know, do you want everybody on mute except the person talking? Do they use a raise hand function? Do they just kind of sit there and wave when they want to, you know, say what they want to say? So. Um, again, in order to make sure that your, your proceeding runs smoothly, it's good to have all of those issues kind of addressed up front so all of the participants know what the rules are and they, they know how to be able to you know, advocate for their, their client um, you know, and participate appropriately in the proceeding itself. Um, the chair may need to step in and be prepared to you know, clarify objections, rule on objections, um, the other thing that, that we have seen is, is um, certainly in voting, um, we have found it preferable to have the chair actually do a roll call vote for all of the members, um, you know, one by one to have the member versus the, the general, you know, all in favor say aye, opposed say nay, um, because then that way it really accurately records uh, what, the, what the vote is in the case. Um, when you're representing a party before an administrative proceeding, you know, I think it's really important to um, take a look at that Board of Commission's rules of procedure. I think that's virtual or non-virtual hearings is important, but um, you know, definitely a little bit more important if you're doing things virtually. Um, most boards of commissions, hopefully their rules of procedures are on that agency's website. You know, if not, there's usually a staff liaison for that board of commission that can provide you. Uh, with that information. Um, but you may also want to coordinate with that staff liaison just to see if there are any of different rules or procedures, you know, because it's a virtual meeting, again, to make sure that you're informed and have that information. Um, again, I think it's important to be able to, if you are referring to documents, to either refer to a, you know, packet page number um, or, you know, some kind of exhibit number to make sure that those are um, prepared in advance and that everybody has knowledge of, you know, what that numbering process is going to be. Um, another issue is um, if you're going to be calling witnesses, if you're an attorney representing a party and you're going to be calling witnesses, to really think about how you're going to do that. Um, we've seen cases where um, the attorney and the witness have been in different places. But we've also, seen, we've also seen occasions where the attorney and the witnesses were all in one room together. Um, I've found it a little distracting that when there's like three or four people in one room and there's kind of the questioning back and forth, I think one of it, it's just kind of a, sometimes a distance and sound issue because you know, you're not really focusing on the person who's, who's making the statement. So sometimes it can be a little bit hard to, um, you know, follow if there's multiple people in the same room um, trying to do the, the back and forth. So, I mean, that's a factor to think about um, as well. So really those are kind of the, the primary issues I think that you need to be focused on, but I think in all cases, just, you know, be prepared and be very flexible. Um, you know, we've had, one occasion that for whatever reason, the Zoom connection wasn't working well. So we had to end the meeting and then start it back up again, 15 minutes later. So, um, you know, just be kind of be ready, prepared for anything. With that, you know, if there's questions or discussion, be happy to, to further respond. Lynn, thank you. I, I think, uh, you know, it's obviously very interesting to hear how a virtual uh, administrative hearing is working, particularly where you have the attorney and the witness in the same room uh, with uh, what I would imagine is a great opportunity to coach the witness as to uh, what to say or what not to say or to correct a mistaken uh, factual uh, <laughs> bit of testimony. 
But uh, so what, what sort of technical issues uh, aside from Zoom failure have you had? Any uh, sort of technical problems? And I guess this to the whole group, what sort of technical issues have you seen in your uh, arguments? Uh, Judge Booth, you want to take the lead on this? Sure. And some of this may have been um, things that, you know, as the court, we even worked through, we, we would have our own Zoom tests. But some of the things that I have seen or even interacting with, say, my law clerks are, um, I think it's important if you don't have good uh, high speed Internet or even if you do to the extent possible, use a hardwired connection because then you're not going to have uh, Wi-Fi uh, disruptions. And if you have a slower Wi-Fi connection, it can cause an echo. And so I think it's also useful if you have that, those types of technical issues to have um, headphones because the headphones actually reduce the echo. The echo seems to be caused when you have a, a lower bandwidth, um, you're hearing the echo through that slow internet connection. And sometimes it can be difficult to figure out who has the slow internet connection and is creating the echo. Um, also, I think it's important to have if, you, if you're doing something that, you know, whether it's circuit court or appellate court, where you could have an, a technical issue, um, to have an iPad or um, iPhone with the Zoom app or whatever platform you're using handy, because if, if you have a disruption with your computer, sometimes it's easier to get on one of those other types of uh, devices. And we've seen that happen um, where there was a technical issue, somebody could jump on um, another device. And finally, with respect to the appellate courts, I know that both courts have usually um, IT people from the Maryland judiciary on hand. And one of the complaints that the clerk's office has said is if, if a litigant is having a technical difficulty, they should definitely don't just try to troubleshoot it yourself, but explain that to the clerk's office because it may very well be that they have the resources available to help troubleshoot that right away. Um, so those are some of the, the technical issues. I think that as long as we can hear you, um, everything is good, even if we can't see you. But um, the, the trouble really becomes if, if we can't hear you. Uh, the other thing is if you're reading, make sure you're close to a mic. We've had a few arguments where we couldn't hear what the, the litigant is saying. And, and so the chief has to keep interrupting and you know, asking them to repeat themselves. And that's probably a function of not having the microphone as well. Correct. Or being far, farther, farther away, as, right. as Brenda mentioned, if you're standing at a podium and you're, you're, you're trying to get the full view of, of yourself, you might, you might not uh, be close enough that it's, the microphone is picking up what you're saying. Gotcha. Uh, just as uh, one example, we had someone do a presentation for us not too long ago where uh, he was at his law firm and standing where apparently they had quite a bit of good technology, but his jacket kept banging against the microphone of the computer or the table, and it was completely disruptive. And it was a wonderful presentation, but for that. So, you know, it's, it's those little things. If you have paper and you're banging it against your computer, your computer microphone's gonna pick that up. It's stuff that, you know, a lot, a lot of things we wouldn't think about uh, in the, the, the real world, but now that we're in the virtual world, we have to think about. Brenda, did you have anything? In my last argument, right when I started, the judges said, we can't hear you. And I don't know why that happened. I just talked louder in my kitchen. Um, I have heard in the Court of Special Appeals of technical difficulties where the court said, uh, I think it was in a case that was first or second on the docket. Okay, you go work this out. We'll go on to the other case and hear you at the end. And, and they were able to resolve them. So I think, again, this is, uh, you know, you could have a flat tire on the way to the courthouse. And, and this is sort of a virtual equi equivalent of the flat tire. And I, when, we got a chat uh, from a, our IT person who uh, said another good tip is to have a phone available so that if uh, nothing else works, you can make, phone in to make your oral presentation, even if everything else is not working. Uh, Lynn, how about uh, in Gaithersburg? Do you have an IT person there to help for through the difficulties when the meetings are going on? Um, we generally do, although 
our IT department is now trying to get all the clerks trained uh, for the various boards and commissions, um, I guess to lessen their caseload a little bit or their workload a little bit. Um, some issues that, that we've had, uh, we've discovered with some platforms, probably I don't wanna trash any particular platform, but go to meetings that unless everybody is muted except the speaker, there's a lot of like background and reverberation. It just really is very difficult to hear. Uh, you know, so if you want to have, you know, more than one person unmuted at the same time, you know, you really kind of need to look at, you know, what platform works best for that. We have not necessarily in the administrative proceedings, but in our regular mayor and council meetings, we have a, a section that's, um, you know, public comments where people do have to sign up in advance. Um, we have had some technical issues with, you know, not really from the city side, but from the public side of people being able to, you know, connect in. Uh, to those um, we have, our IT department has prepared this like 30 second video that they play at the beginning of every public comment. So, you know, this is how you, you have to hit, you know, raise hand, you have to unmute, this is how you do it. And we play that every, every meeting and um, you know, still occasionally we'll have one or two people that for whatever, for, you know, their technical reasons, they can't uh, connect and, and make their, their public comments. Gotcha. You know, we actually have an IT person who's running our meeting for us. And <laughs> Phil, you actually have a tip for us and you want to chime in, please feel free to do so. I, I will give you a little tip that I found early on. I, I have purchased a much higher uh, internet speed. And so hopefully it's not a problem now, but I would have to turn off Outlook uh, because the emails that I was getting was taking up the bandwidth. And so there would be a lot of disruptions in, in the audio portion of the presentation as the emails would be coming in. Uh, and, it, you know, even, I mean, I guess some of them are large, but uh, even the ones that were relatively small seem to have some disruptive effects. So turning off Outlook is sometimes not a bad idea. If you have other uh, search functions in the background, a, uh, and if you're using Google or you're using Bing or one of the others, you might want to turn all of them off other than the one you're using for Zoom and or your whatever platform you're using uh, to try to reduce the amount of load on your bandwidth. Uh, any other thoughts? I know uh, we've got now that we since we have Judge Booth. I mean, come on, let's let's get as much information as we can, right? <laughs> and, so, and and I, another one. These are just random thoughts coming into my head yeah. as I'm thinking about arguments. Um, I do think it's important to mute yourself, and in addition, um, if you are, are going to leave your argument spot, turn off your camera. Um, it's distracting if while the other while while the opponent is talking, if if you have the the respondent, let's say while the petitioner is arguing, walking around his 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 or her space, um, again just like oral arguments in person, uh, when you're not arguing arguing, you wouldn't meander around the courthouse. <laughs> so, I think I think to the extent you can minimize distractions. Um, if, if you're sitting with co-counsel, it's particularly important to, to, to mute yourself when you're not speaking so that the court isn't picking up, you know, conversations they shouldn't. Um, so, you, you know, just be mindful that you're on camera and, and what you're doing is, is, is being picked up. It's, it's probably, there's even a heightened sense of, of movement. I know, you know, I might try to stifle a yawn from the bench and, and maybe no one would have noticed if I'm yawning, but if I'm sitting here with my mouth open on a Zoom camera, it just seems <laughs> like the, the attention is, is on you, so. Yeah, I have to say that's something that I'm very conscious of as an advocate. Um, they advised us in the CSA and, and I think in the CX, uh, Court of Appeals by the clerk that the best way to uh, do the argument is to have the Zoom so that you're seeing every member of the bench and opposing counsel all at once. And what that means is that even when you're not arguing, if everyone has that view, you are on the camera. So I think even more than in the courtroom, um, you need to behave, uh, presumably not make faces, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in terms of technical glitches, one more that I had, and again, this is, it happens, it, it used to happen with the lights too. My last court of special appeals argument, 
um, when it came time for me to re uh, have rebuttal, I was talking and talking and I look at the clock, it says four more minutes and I talk a little bit more and it said four more minutes and a little bit more and it said four more minutes. And at that point it dawned on me that the clerk I think hadn't started the clock. And so my time had been up maybe two minutes ago. <laughs> um, and uh, finally the presiding judge pointed, you know, I, I, at that point I think I stopped, but um, that wasn't even, I, I didn't consider that my uh, issue. It was the way the technology was working from the Court of Special Appeals end. But anything can happen in any of these arguments, and it's just a little, uh, with a little twist when you're doing it virtually. And, and to add to add on to that, I, I, I should have mentioned it earlier. I do think it's very important at the appellate courts that you have gallery view if you're using Zoom selected and that allows you to see everyone. Um, and it's particularly important when judges are asking you questions because you can see everyone. Um, and another kind of benefit to uh, this technology, even though you know there's a lot of um, cons is that both courts ha do have a running clock. So if you have gallery view selected, you can see the running clock and hopefully it's set right. It sounds like uh, <laughs> there was a malfunction there with, with Brenda's, but um, I would find that useful as, and I find it useful um, as, as a judge to know how much time it, it, it is there. So if you have the gallery view on, you can, you can see that clock. I have to say that one thing I do find disconcerting with the gallery view is when the judge one of you asks a question, even though I'm familiar with all of your voices, I'm not sure where it's coming from at first. And I don't know what it, I don't know if it's that the sound travels quicker than, than, than the views or what, but in real life, when you ask a question, I know which judge, immediately which judge it's coming from. And when I'm arguing virtually, I do feel like I'm on a one second delay where I'm hearing the question, but I haven't figured out who's asking it yet. Interesting. Lynn, any thoughts, last thoughts? Yeah, no, I think we've, we've covered uh, pretty much all the points that I wanted to make. All right, Brenda. No, I enjoyed being here. Thank you for doing this. Oh, thanks for doing it. Uh, Judge Booth, any last uh, remarks? Not that I, not that we haven't already covered. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you so much. And uh, what, I guess one last technical thing. I know you, Judge, you said it didn't matter what, uh, what things were going on in the background, but uh, I, I have heard that it really is not a good idea to have your camera pointed at the ceiling when you have a ceiling fan going. And uh, I, Aside from the potential hypnotic effect, I do think it is a bit distracting. So you may want to keep that in mind, uh, even though Judge Booth isn't going to find it problematic. Uh, nope. <laughs> it's always good to avoid distractions. We're human. Yeah. It, it is indeed. It is indeed. Thank you all very much. It's, uh, you, you've been wonderful. It's so great to have you all part of this program. Uh, we will be taking a break until 1.30 to give people an opportunity to grab some lunch. When we come back, we're going to have a program on the public lawyer, a higher calling, and the rules of professional conduct. I think you'll find it extremely interesting. We're going to have a couple of hypotheticals that uh, test whether uh, a public lawyer and the ethics rules uh, can interact well together. And then last uh, on the program today at three, we have policing in America. We have some uh, the city attorneys for some of the major cities in the United States that have been experiencing issues associated with police reform. Uh, Ron Lewis from Houston, Pete Holmes from Seattle, Jim Johnson from New York City, and Esteban Steve Aguilar from Albuquerque, all of whom are very interesting people and uh, leaders in the field who can talk a little bit about the issues of police reform. So, Thank you so much for everything today. I really appreciate it. You've been wonderful. What a terrific panel. And we will see you all back at 1.30. Thank you. Bill, to you. Yes, thank you.
you are now live. All right, thank you. Uh, we have a, I'm trying to get my screen set. Uh, we're, we're back for this afternoon's session. Our first program this afternoon is The Public Lawyer, A Higher Calling Under the Rules of Professional Conduct. And with me on the program is Judge Bob McDonald, uh, Patrick Hughes, who is with the Attorney General's Office and Chief Counsel of Opinions and Advice, a position that Judge McDonald once held, and uh, which was, I suppose, very helpful in uh, figuring out how to write opinions, right, uh, Judge? But at, at any rate, and I'm Chuck Thompson. I'm uh, Executive Director of the International Municipal Lawyers Association and uh, may have one or two things to say as we get into the hypotheticals to address issues that may be associated with local government. But without further ado, Bob, if you can share, Judge McDonald, if you can share your screen. We have a slideshow that uh, we will run through. And I will turn it over to Judge McDonald in just one second. I will tell you that we did this program for the International Municipal Lawyers Association to rave reviews for Judge McDonald. So hopefully we will be able to replicate that here. Judge McDonald. Well, thanks, Chuck. I, uh, since I'm before a home audience, it's going to be a little tougher. I can't fake it as much. Um, I'm sorry we're not all together uh, so that we could interact uh, a little more in this uh, on this topic. Um, I would really like to hear the experiences and reflections of the people on the call. Uh, and we may get to some hypothetical questions later on that uh, you know, Chuck and Patrick uh, may have some thoughts on. Uh, and I invite them both to jump in whenever they, they feel inspired to do so. Um, I was asked to talk about professional ethics, lawyers' ethics, as they relate to government attorneys. And I guess I'll start by saying I come to the topic from three perspectives. Uh, okay, trying to advance my PowerPoint here. Oh, there we go. Um, so as you know, I'm on the, on the Court of Appeals, and the Court of Appeals, as I'm sure you know, regulates the legal profession in, in Maryland. We, share, we actually share that responsibility with the state legislature, but the General Assembly generally defers to the court. And so we set the rules of professional conduct, the ethical rules uh, that govern the profession. And we also uh, uh, are the arbiters of attorney discipline, um, which actually makes up about 10 to 15% of our, our docket in, in the Court of Appeals. And I'll talk about a few of the cases we've had in a minute. But I come to these issues from two other perspectives. Uh, as Chuck mentioned, uh, I uh, spent uh, almost 20 years or a little over 20 years actually in the AG's office in Maryland. And I had a number of different jobs there, but the one I spent the most time in was uh, chief of opinions and advice, uh, which basically acts as a clearinghouse for the various among other things, it acts as a clearinghouse for the various ethical issues that arise. Um, now, I've probably forgotten most of what I knew in that capacity, but luckily, Patrick Hughes, as Chuck said, who has that job now is here and he can correct any mistakes I made make in, uh, in this presentation. Um, and I also spent at the beginning of my career about a decade at the U.S. Attorney's Office, primarily as a criminal prosecutor. And there are some special ethical rules that pertain to prosecutors. We may get to those uh, at the end of this presentation. Um, although I, since I assume most of the people on the call are not prosecutors, I, they, they may have less uh, pertinence to you. Um, so, uh, as you know, the, as, uh, the Court of Appeals adopts the rules of professional conduct for lawyers. They're, they're found, they, in 2016, we've had them for many years, obviously, but they were recodified in 2016, pretty much in the same language that existed before as actual Maryland rules. And it, it's a somewhat ungainly 
codification. Uh, there at rules, Maryland rules 19-300.1 and ever after. And so instead of talking about rule 1.7, which is the general conflicts rule, uh, technically our, our rule is 19-301.7. However, if uh, you read the preamble to the Maryland rules and you get down to uh, paragraph comment to, or paragraph 22, you will see that you're still allowed to use the short names. And that's, that's what I'll do here. And that's what I do generally in the opinions I write. Uh, most of the Maryland uh, rules of professional conduct for lawyers are based on and virtually identical to the ABA model rules. There's a little bit of difference in numbering uh, when you get it, especially when you get into subsections. There's a little bit of difference in language. Some in some parts of the rules, things that are in comments in the ABA model rules have been moved into the text in, in the Maryland rules or vice versa. Um, but for the most part, they're identical. Um, but be aware that there might be a difference if you're looking to out-of-state cases on the uh, Maryland rules. Be be aware that there could be a difference, and and just make sure you you check that out. Um, so a, as you also know, uh, lawyers in Maryland have other sort of ethical type rules to comply with. For lawyers who work for the state, there's the Maryland Public Ethics Law, which is at General Provisions article. It's in the General Provisions article. Um, there are also, and even in, in that public ethics law, there are some <clears throat> provisions that apply just to particular counties. Um, then there could also be a local ethics law that you need to comply with for agencies that are funded uh, by the have federal funding, you might have to consider whether the Hatch Act applies, which restricts political activities. Uh, but generally speaking, the state anti, what we refer to as the state anti-Hatch Act uh, applies, which uh, protects the ability of state employees to engage in political activity. There may also be agency policies. Uh, when I was in the AG's office, and I think it's still true, I think it's been true for maybe 40 years at least now that there was a policy against uh, separate private practice by the lawyers in the AG's office. Um, there are some exceptions, like the, uh, if you uh, do pro bono work in accordance with the pro bono program of the office, but for the most part, there's a ban on private practice. And of course, all lawyers in Maryland have certain annual filing requirements uh, that in order to remain in good standing in the bar. And uh, so uh, they're not technically ethical requirements. Uh, and if you fail to carry them out, you don't really get disciplined, you get decertified, which you don't wanna get either. So uh, at any rate, I'm not gonna talk about any of these other rules. I'm gonna focus on the lawyer's ethics rules. So if, if you, uh, for those of you who ever worked as a prosecutor, you probably heard a defense attorney at some point say, uh, tell a jury that the government wins when justice is done. Um, and uh, those of you, uh, and, and they were sort of saying to the jury in my time, uh, don't worry about disappointing those uh, nice young prosecutors uh, if you come back with a not guilty verdict because it's a win-win situation. The government wins and the defendant wins. Of course, I always uh, thought if, in order for justice to be done, the defendant had to be convicted. Uh, but, uh, but the statement is generally true. Uh, and it turns out that this uh, statement is inscribed in uh, the Great Hall in the Department of Justice in Washington. It's attributed to Frederick Lehman. He was a solicitor general uh, about a century ago, and he was known for confessing error in the appellate courts when he believed that the government was in the wrong. So that's part of why 
I, I think, and I think it's true that there is a higher standard in terms of lawyers' ethics that apply to government attorneys. Another uh, version or similarly famous, perhaps more famous version of that sentiment is in a Supreme Court case called Berger versus United States, which says that in which the court said the prosecutor is a representative, not of an ordinary party to a controversy, but of a sovereignty whose obligation to govern impartially is as compelling as its obligation to govern at all and whose interest therefore in a criminal prosecution is not that it shall win the case, but that justice shall be done. And this quote, you will see it in many cases, usually criminal cases, but it comes up uh, often. The court uh, uh, repeats it. I think though, it, you can apply the statement or the sentiment, not just to prosecutors, but to any government attorney. The premise was, is that the attorney for the government uh, represents a different kind of party, not an ordinary party in the language of Berger. Uh, and that puts some constraints on what an attorney might otherwise be able to do in that representation. So you can restate the statement in Berger as I've got in this slide. Uh, and I think it applies uh, to any government attorney. So the, perhaps the most eloquent or my favorite version of this idea is, was in a speech given by Attorney General Robert Jackson in April 1940 to a gathering of United States attorneys. So you may know uh, Robert Jackson. He later became a, a justice of the Supreme Court, and he took leave from that job to become one of the uh, prosecutors in the Nuremberg trials after World War II. And he wrote many uh, eloquent uh, judicial opinions, uh, including uh, you know, famous dissent in the Korematsu case in which he opposed the uh, court's approval of the detention of American citizens of Japanese an ancestry. So the, the speech in 1940 was a sort of pep talk to uh, the US attorneys who were under, you know, under his command, so to speak. And um, like many of his opinions, it's, I think it's particularly eloquent. And I, oh, I had uh, put together some materials that, that you may have gotten in, uh, I'll just throw to the, in PDF form, and I would have handed them out if we uh, had been together. Uh, and you don't need them for this talk, but uh, some of this is in there which you can look at at your leisure. And attachment A in, in those materials is the full speech, Jackson's full speech. Uh, and in that speech, he urged a rededication to the spirit of fair play and decency that should animate the government attorney. He told them that uh, your positions are of such independence and importance that while you're being diligent, strict, and vigorous in law enforcement, you can afford to be just. Um, and, while they were directed to people who primarily did criminal prosecutions, I think they, the sentiment applies to all government attorneys or those attorneys who exercise or advise the exercise of the powers of government. Um, this is the ending paragraph of the speech. He, he closes with saying that a sensitiveness to fair play and sportsmanship is perhaps the best protection against the abuse of power and the citizen's safety lies in the prosecutor who temp tempers zeal with human kindness, who seeks truth and not victims and who serves the law and not factional purposes and who approaches his task with humility. So this, uh, this rhetoric, I find it all very moving, um, but why, so why is there a higher standard for government attorney? Uh, what's the source of it? As some of those quotes uh, I just alluded to say, uh, it has to do with the client of the government attorney. It's not an ordinary client. And I think you can also relate it back to the uh, 
uh, oath you took when you joined the Maryland Bar. Uh, if you remember, uh, you said not only that you would demean yourself fairly and honorably as an attorney, but you, all attorneys who take that oath, swear to uphold the Maryland Constitution and support and defend the US Constitution. Every Maryland attorney takes that oath. And uh, I have the text of it. It's a relatively short oath. It's uh, under attachment B in the materials uh, in the PDF. So as you know, constitutions, the state constitution and the federal constitution basically do two things. First, they set out the structure of government. And second, they set certain limits or constraints on government and government actors. And if you're in private practice, you may not have to deal much with either of those things, with either the uh, concern, the structure of state or local government or federal government or the limits on that government. But if you're a government attorney, you're called upon to advise officials how to act lawfully within the structures of government and how to exercise the coercive powers, what are sometimes coercive powers of government and sometimes attorneys exercise those themselves. So the attorney's oath, at least the one we take in Maryland can have a particular residence for a government attorney. So I'll turn to our attorney discipline uh, docket for a few minutes. So I looked at one of the recent reports of the Attorney Grievance Commission. Um, and while I, sit, while I say or take the position that government attorneys must satisfy a higher standard, it seems safe to say that in our disciplinary cases, government attorneys are underrepresented. Uh, according to, uh, to that report, over the course of a decade, the court sanctioned about 600 attorneys. And by my count, uh, about six of those attorneys were government attorneys. So if you do the math, that's about 1% about of the attorneys who get disciplined uh, are government, were government attorneys during that decade. But government attorneys make up a much larger percentage than 1% of the Maryland bar. The attorney general's office, uh, I think has about 400 lawyers, which probably by itself is 1% of the Maryland bar. And of course there are many county and municipal attorneys as well as attorneys in multi-county agencies, as well as other state agencies. Um, and this being Maryland, there are many attorneys uh, for the federal government who uh, reside in Maryland and uh, belong to the Maryland Bar. I'm married to one of them. So, so if you just look at the numbers, you might think uh, government attorneys are largely staying out of trouble with bar counsel in our state, at least on a proportional basis. Does this mean government attorneys are simply more ethical or better at observing the rules? Maybe, but that's probably not the entire story. So here's a question you can think about. I won't ask you to answer it um, yourselves. Uh, um, what's the most common violation of lawyer ethics by Maryland attorneys? Lack of competence and diligence, lack of communication with the client, mishandling money, or all of the above? Well, as you may have guessed, it's all of the above. Uh, the, the most common uh, violations in our disciplinary cases of our court concern what I would call minimum standards for an attorney, uh, uh, practicing in a competent manner, uh, abiding by the client's directions, acting diligently, and communicating appropriately with the client. It's rules, as you can see the rules in the, sl in the slide, they're the uh, first four rule, you know, basic rules of the rules of professional conduct. 
we haven't seen many violations of those rules with government attorneys. Um, now, probably a good part of that is government attorneys don't have individual clients for the most part. And if there's a problem with one of these uh, standards with a government attorney, uh, the res result may be that the attorney gets reassigned or there's some sort of personnel action, but probably the agency doesn't complain the bar council. The second largest, most common violation we see in our disciplinary cases involves money. The most egregious violations involve misappropriation of client funds. But there are plenty of other ways a lawyer can violate the rules with money. It can in involve mishandling a trust account. Lawyer, private attorneys have trust accounts where they're supposed to keep client funds secure. Uh, sometimes uh, a, an attorney will have an assistant who's been delegated uh, handling money that the attorney doesn't supervise correctly or properly, adequately. And uh, occasionally there are fee issues where the, if the attorney doesn't do the work, the fee is per se unreasonable. Um, again, we don't see these violations with government attorneys and because government attorneys for the most part don't handle money. So let's uh, have a question about government attorneys. What's the most common factor in, in the violation of lawyer ethics by government attorneys? Red tape? excessive bureaucratic language, sex lies and videotape, a computer. So if you think of the most dangerous item within the attorney's reach in a government office uh, that is not money, uh, an instrument of power, but also an instrument of wrongdoing, it can be the computer. Gonna talk about a few examples of our disciplinary actions involving government attorneys, relatively recent ones. Uh, you'll find them in the PDF under attachment C. <clears throat> and uh, as I said, oh, in a little more detail, this slide shows uh, the specific rule violations. They're generally 8.4D, which is uh, conduct it's a very kind of open-ended uh, standard called conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice. 8.4C has to do with dishonesty, misrepresentation. Um, some of them involve misuse of government property and or the rules relating to prosecutors, but inevitably it seems like there's a computer involved in just about all of them. So the most recent case we had was Attorney Grievance versus Markey and Hancock. Uh, the case arose from a group of attorneys who worked in the Department of Veterans Affairs in Washington and who referred to themselves as the Forum of Hate. Uh, for approximately seven years, these attorneys exchanged emails uh, among themselves during work hours on their government computers using their VA email addresses. Uh, and uh, to, to put it mildly, they expressed contempt for and made demeaning references to fellow workers at the VA and other people that were based on ethnicity, sex, and sexual orientation. Two of the lawyers uh, were members of the Maryland Bar. Um, you can read the, the opinion, came out in June for the details on their remarks that probably not suitable for a family-oriented presentation. And a lot of them were new um, terminology to most of us. The Bar Council had to give us a glossary. Um, they weren't things we'd heard before. Um, as I said, two of the lawyers were members of the Maryland Bar. Um, one was an, an administrative law judge in the VA. Uh, the emails eventually got out uh, they were publicized in a newspaper article, as I understand, and a, an attorney grievance complaint was filed against the two Maryland lawyers. They didn't deny the conduct. Uh, the, our court found that they violated Rule 8.4D, that sort of general rule uh, forbidding conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice. 
uh, as well as Rule 8.4E, which uh, states that it's misconduct for a lawyer to manifest by words or conduct uh, when acting in a professional capacity, bias or prejudice based on various personal factors. The court Im imposed an indefinite suspension on the two Maryland attorneys, but uh, probably that was not the most serious thing that happened to them. They both lost their jobs at the VA. I don't know what happened to the other members of the group. They were barred in other states. Second case uh, is called Attorney Grievance versus Greenleaf. Mr. Greenleaf had served as an assistant state's attorney in two counties on the Eastern Shore. He had been acting state's attorney in Caroline County. Uh, and in 2004, he became the chief deputy clerk of the Court of Special Appeals in Annapolis. Um, in 2010, uh, police were conducting an internet investigation in which an officer uh, pretended to be a 14-year-old girl named Beth. The officer ended up engaging in 150 sexually explicit email conversations over a six-month period with someone using a judiciary computer, who turned out to be Mr. Greenleaf. And among other things, Mr. Greenleaf sent Beth pornographic videos and invited her to have sex with him. Uh, he was, he was uh, ultimately arrested and entered an Alford plea. That's a, a sort of a guilty plea in which you, the defendant uh, does not really admit guilt, but does admit that there'd be sufficient um, evidence to convict him if the case went to trial. So Mr. Greenleaf was sentenced to, in, the, in the case to probation before judgment. He lost his job with the Court of Special Appeals, an attorney discipline proceeding was brought against him, and he was found to have violated uh, the rules listed on that slide, 8.4b, which uh, makes it misconduct to commit a criminal act that reflects poorly on the person as an attorney, um, 8.4c, the dishonesty rule, and because he was, court did not expect him to be using his computer for this purpose, so he was viewed as being dishonest in that respect. And 8.4D, the general conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice. He argued his own case before us and really didn't have much of a defense other than he'd, than he'd done a great job uh, helping the intermediate uh, appellate court clean up its filing. Um, but he was, he was disbarred. Um, the third case, and the last one I'll mention for the moment, uh, involves uh, somebody named McDonald, who's not related to me. Um, it's uh, Attorney Grievance versus John Mark McDonald. He was also an assistant state's attorney from the Eastern Shore and became deputy state's attorney in Queen Anne's County. Um, and in that capacity, he became involved in an inappropriate relationship with the office manager. Uh, the opinion doesn't go into greater detail on that. Uh, may not have been a wise thing to do, maybe not, but maybe not a violation of the lawyer's ethics rules. However, uh, it ended up being the motivation for conduct that did violate the ethics rules. Uh, it turned out the office manager was embezzling money from the uh, office and was, so, was being investigated and ultimately prosecuted by an independent counsel. Uh, that prosecution, Mr. McDonald attempted to influence. He also fixed some traffic tickets for her and assisted in her in filing some false timesheets. And after she was dismissed, terminated from the office, from her employment, he deleted emails from her computer. Uh, and uh, a case, an attorney grievance met, what complaint was filed against him. The case came up to us. He was disbarred for uh, violation of 8.4C, the dishonesty rule, and 8.4D, conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice. Um, in, in the opinion uh, in this case, Judge Harrell, who wrote the opinion, uh, relied, noted, 
that prosecutors are held to a higher standard given their unique role as advocates and ministers of justice. And he quoted an ABA standard that's on this slide that disbarment is generally appropriate when a lawyer in an official or governmental position knowingly misuses the position with intent to obtain a significant benefit or advantage for himself or another. And so that was applied in Mr. McDonald's case and he was disbarred. So I suppose the uh, lessons perhaps from these cases are don't engage in disparaging and derogatory conversations about people based on sex or ethnicity. Don't make assignations with someone you think is an underage woman and don't have an affair with an office mate and then cover up her wrongdoing. But whatever you do, don't do it with a government computer. Uh, just, um, the, these are the cases uh, that, or the violations that result in cases before us that make the headlines, maybe a case book. I imagine most of you won't have the problems these guys did. The more common and subtle ethical issues for government lawyers usually don't result in disciplinary cases, but they're, they can be very vexing as, in their own right. And so now we'll talk about probably things that are more pertinent to, to most of you. Um, and first thing, some rules to, some particularly pertinent rules for government attorneys. Um, I, I put them in four categories. The first is not really the rule, it's the preamble to the rules. It's entitled a lawyer's responsibilities. It, it turns out it's longer than any of the rules. It summarizes uh, somewhat eloquently the rules that follow. And in some respects, it, it explains the underlying purposes of those rules. It's sort of like the overture that precedes a musical or an opera, brings all the themes together at the outset. And it occurred to me when I was preparing for this session and for the time we did this one before, that I probably ought to read it more often than I do. Uh, I've included, there's a copy of it in the materials. Uh, uh, I believe it's uh, attachment D. I've included the, both the preamble and the other rules I'm gonna mention. Uh, there are two rules, second category, there are two rules relating to organizations or that are particularly pertinent to organizations. Rule 1.13, concerns issues that arise with organizational clients, both private and public organizations. Rule 4.2 is not specifically about organizations, it's about communications with a represented person. But that become, it becomes a important rule when you're talking about an organization that is a represented person. Uh, so it comes up when a government attorney is dealing with people in an organization like a corporation, and that corporation is represented by an attorney. How far does this rule govern those communications? Or when an outside lawyer is communicating with officials or employees of a government agency, which itself is an organization and which it has representation by the government attorney. Uh, Rule 1.11 talks about the conflicts and that can arise when one moves from government employment to private employment or vice versa. And it gives some ground rules for how to conduct yourself when you're in that situation. Uh, I don't know if we'll talk about it much today. I think Chuck knows a lot more about this rule than I do. So I, it it's, hasn't come up in our cases since I've been on the court. Um, and finally, the fourth category is the special rules for prosecutors. There's a rule 3.8 on the special responsibilities of a prosecutor and rule 3.6 on trial publicity that has some pitfalls for government attorneys, especially prosecutors. Uh, courts have said that, yes, the trial publicity rule applies to both sides of the case, but um, government, the prosecutor or the government attorney has to be more uh, circumspect and adhere to it, uh, I think, more carefully. 
So I'm going to start with a couple questions that'll tee off the next few things I'm going to talk about, and then we might get to some hypotheticals similar to these questions. So you're the attorney for, for a local government that includes an executive, a legislative body, and various departments. Who can speak for the client? Who should you listen to? Who may invoke the attorney-client privilege? What else should you consider? I would love to hear your answers on this. Uh, question four of our questions. The local government or your local government consists of various departments, boards, and agencies. One of these boards, a board of appeals, decides appeals of decisions by other agencies of the local government. May the uh, local government attorney's office advise both the board of appeals and represent an agency that is a party to a matter before the board of appeals. Now you can get some direction, if not a always a precise answer on these two questions in the disciplinary rules and the commentary, uh, particularly uh, the preamble and rule 1.13. And there are two uh, attorney general opinions uh, from some years ago that address these and, and provide, I think, some pretty good summaries. I, the, the first one I was, was before my time, but it's really a classic to go back to and, and uh, consult. Um, so the preamble, as I said, is entitled, the preamble to the rules, to the rules of professional conduct is entitled A Lawyer's Responsibilities. And paragraph 18 of the preamble specifically addresses government attorneys. It says under various provisions, including constitution, statute, common law, the responsibilities of government attorneys may include authority uh, concerning legal matters that ordinarily reposes in the client in private attor client attorney relationships. And it also says, relevant to the second question I just put up there, government attorneys may be authorized to represent several government agencies in intra-governmental intra legal controversies where a private attorney could not do so, would have a conflict. This uh, all relates to the question that often comes up, I'm sure many of you know, who's the client? Uh, So um, the answer to that question, uh, as the quotes from the preamble suggested, uh, often depend on the particular structure of the government bo governmental body and the law that governs it. And there may be no one size fits all answer to this question. Uh, rule 1.13 states that uh, the government attorney represents the organization acting through its duly authorized constituents. And constituents in this sense means employees or officials of the government agency, not the voters. Um, so you have to figure out who the duly authorized of the constituents, who are the duly authorized one. Uh, and there's a comment to this rule that says, uh, look to local law to determine who speaks for the client. So uh, when the org uh, there is another comment to rule 1.13 that says for most organizations, the decisions must ordinarily be accepted by the lawyer even if their utility or prudence is doubtful. And uh, uh, when I was in the AG's office, occasionally we would people would joke that um, there were decisions to be made by the client, the lawyer couldn't overrule them, but they wished they had a stamp that said uh, legally sufficient, but stupid or something like that. But there may be times when the government attorney may have duties beyond the loyalty to the agency or, or its agents. Government lawyers may have the authority under applicable law to question conduct more extensively than a lawyer for a private organization, and those are in the comments to the rules. Um, so, uh, and in the, oh, the two uh, 
AG opinions I, re I was referring to, they both involve the, the St. Mary's County uh, attorney, as you know, a relatively small uh, rural county uh, governed by a board of county commissioners. The corporate entity, the first opinion involved, uh, who's, who's the client? Who speaks for that corporate entity? Um, and the detail, there's a fairly detailed and well-reasoned uh, answer given in that opinion. It, if you have the materials, it's under attachment E. It's not a long opinion. It may be the most worthwhile thing uh, in the attachments. Um, it was written by Jack Schwartz, my predecessor. Um, and So it, as again, uh, the, both the preamble and the rule look to local law. So the second issue has to do with multiple representation where you have the second question four, you have two public agencies in the same proceeding. One's the tribunal and the other is an agency litigant. Um, and normally a private attorney couldn't be involved with both of those entities, uh, it would be a conflict. Uh, but local law may allow such multiple representation. It's certainly allowed in the state where we have assistant attorneys general who uh, represent uh, a, for instance, a license, uh, a licensing uh, board. You'll have prosecutors and advisors to the licensing board uh, that are both assistant AGs. Uh, but there's, you still have to take into account uh, fairness to the to third parties, which may involve uh, screening the attorneys from one another or screening their files from one another, uh, that sort of thing. And the second St. Mary's County AG opinion spells out some of that. So, <clears throat> Um, before we get to question five, um, Patrick uh, had developed a couple hypotheticals, which I'm, since I can't ask the audience to respond to, I think they're pretty good. I'll just ask him uh, to respond to his own hypotheticals. Uh, number one, the client agency has a board and an executive director that don't always see eye to eye. The board asks for legal advice on a question, but the executive director tells you the advice is not necessary. What do you do? So Patrick, what's the answer? Well, uh, thanks, thanks Judge McDonald, and uh, been enjoying your presentation so far. Um, I should you know, throw out the standard caveat before I start that uh, is my own thinking on this and not uh, an official opinion of, uh, of the attorney general or the attorney general's office. Um, and interested, uh, Chuck, Judge McDonald, if you want to jump in with your own thoughts. I think, um, you know, that they're both legal and um, non-legal interpersonal <laughs> dynamics at play here. And I, I'm just going to focus on, um, on the legal ones. I think, um, from a legal perspective, um, the first step, as you just uh, intimated in your presentation, would be to try to figure out who the client is um, in this particular situation and who has the legal authority to speak for the client um, in the particular context that um, you're dealing with. So, you know, that's. Um, is this frustrating with a lot of these questions, that's going to be a fact and, and law specific inquiry that depends on um, you know, the, the laws governing the particular um, legal office, the laws governing the particular um, client agency, um, the facts of the particular situation. I think you know, it's fair to say, and this is what um, the first of the two AG opinions um, Judge McDonald mentioned um, says that, you know, as a general matter, um, you know, the client um, is um, <clears throat> the, uh, <clears throat> it's not the individual um, constituents or employees or officers um, of a government entity 
the, the client is usually um, either the government writ large or the particular government agency um, that's being uh, uh, represented. Um, and so um, you're, you're not gonna be looking to the individual members of, of the board or the executive director necessarily as your individual clients. Um, so then you know, the question would become whether um, in this particular instance, it's the, the board that's asked for the advice or the executive director um, who's asked for there, be, there to be no advice um, that is the uh, <clears throat> you know, constituent um, to use that uh, term within the broader organization that has the authority um, to make that decision. And I, my, my guess is that in most instances that would probably um, be the board, which you know, usually is um, you know, the entity um, that is uh, charged with um, you know, <clears throat> implementing the particular statutory scheme that they've been given responsibility for and the executive director works for the board. Um, but again, um, it's gonna depend on the particular factual and legal situation. Chuck, Judge McDonald, I don't know if you have anything to add, but I think that's how one would go about parsing that, that question. I wondered if Chuck ever faced this question. Not that specific one. I think the, the, the uh, practical uh, response that uh, Patrick deftly avoided was, who can fire you? And uh, if, if it's the uh, board who can fire you, then you write the opinion. If it's the executive director who can fire you, you probably tell the board that the executive director has said, uh, you don't need to write an opinion. But from a, a more, uh, I, I definitely agree with what Patrick had to say, but normally you're gonna find in the statute that creates the board, the authorities of each, whether it's the executive director has certain executive authorities and what, what authorities the board has. Absent that, you might also look at uh, whether you are in-house or outside counsel. If you're outside counsel and working on an hourly fee basis, and you are, as a result of writing an opinion, uh, creating a cost to the agency, if the board doesn't have the authority to uh, create that cost, then it may be that it's really the, only the executive director that can incur a, an expense uh, for the agency and you would have to have the executive director's approval. That, that's interesting. I, I hadn't been, you know, as a internal government lawyer, I don't always think about things from the perspective of um, a, an outside counsel, but that's an interesting, um, that's an interesting point. And I, I um, Agree, Chuck, and sort of you said more eloquently what I was trying to say in terms of you need to look at the particular law that's at play. I think the statute is likely to lay out situations where um, the statute of ordinance or whatever we're talking about is likely to lay out um, the powers of the board versus the powers of the executive director who has decision-making responsibility um, in particular areas. And that's where you're going, you know, the first place where you're gonna want to look. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, with the state, you're probably in a much better position than you would be in a lot of local governments where the creation of boards and the assignment of authority is not quite as extensive usually as you might find in a state statute. Mm -hmm. One of the things, you know, uh, Judge McDonald, when, when you were talking about the agencies in the same proceeding, I think you're absolutely right in this, at the state level, it's very common. Uh, and, and the definition of responsibilities is very clear. At the local level, there can be some difficulties and there are some opinions, uh, one really good opinion out of California, ethics opinion, that uh, discusses the fact that if the agency is an independent agency that is independent uh, in, and has the right to sue and be sued, for example, that you may not have this, the same ability for dual representation as you would have if the agency is clearly one within the organizational ambit of uh, the representational authority of the attorney's office. So as county attorney, for example, I had the representational authority for all of the agencies of county government. But if 
one of those agencies had the authority to sue and be sued and hire their own attorney, that might uh, make things a little bit different. And uh, despite that uh, being county attorney, I might have a conflict there if I tried dual representation. But we would always do things similarly to the attorney general, and that would be to have attorneys represent the agency and have attorneys represent uh, the county before the agency, but to screen those different attorneys. Okay, the uh, second hypothetical I have is two different agencies within the same local government disagree about whether the local government has the legal authority to take a certain action. One of the agencies stands to benefit from the action and the other might not. Can your office advise both agencies about what the law allows? Uh, I'll try to jump in on that one, uh, having the local government experience. I, I believe that you do have that authority, that both agencies are uh, within, they're, they're, it's basically like a family, you know, and if you have your kids having a dispute, do you have the authority as the parent to uh, regulate that dispute? And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the attorney's not the parent, but at the same time, the attorney is representing the organization as a whole and has the responsibility to write an opinion as to which of those agencies has what authority that they claim. That's, uh, I, I think there would be very few situations where I would see that the attorney would need outside counsel. Now, politically, there are often times when it's better to get outside counsel to deal with those situations so that uh, you can retain your position. <laughs> yeah, I, I think- Practical um, and legal advice the, here. <laughs> I, think, um, I think that's right. I think, you know, from a sort of strictly legal perspective, I think this question um, brings two uh, main considerations into play. One is the same question of who is the client. Um, and in this context, um, and, and one of the AG opinions Judge McDonald talked about says this, um, that you know, generally um, the client is the government um, as a whole, so it's the local government as a whole. Um, and um, you know, if, that's, if that's the case in the particular situation um, you're dealing with, you know, there's, there's not going to be a, a, there can't be a conflict by definition if you're representing the same client um, and giving the same advice to two different agencies, but that are part of the same um, overall client. But even if you're in a situation where, for whatever reason, the who is the client analysis would lead you to a conclusion that there are two different, um, you know, client agencies at play, um, as Judge McDonald said, there's um, the preamble to the, um, rules of professional conduct that indicate that um, lawyers, government lawyers um, for um, you know, public officials that have the duty to represent um, all different branches of state government may be able to um, represent different agencies with different interests um, in intra-governmental disputes where other, otherwise there would be a conflict under the rules. And so you know, the idea here the, att the attorney general, for example, um, is obligated by constitution and by statute to represent um, almost all Maryland government um, agencies. And um, you know, that uh, <clears throat> the, the rules don't trump um, that uh, legal obligation of the attorney general to provide advice to all of these myriad government agencies, even if they might not um, you know, necessarily see eye to eye on the particular um, legal question at, at issue. Um, so I, I agree with Chuck both as, you know, the, the uh, legal matter and um, that there might be other practical considerations that might lead one to decide um, that it's a good idea to get outside counsel for one side or another. But in terms of, you know, being strictly required, um, it seems unlikely in, in most circumstances that there would be um, an actual conflict that was with all of these questions, you've got to look at the particular 
factual scenarios it comes up at the law that governs um, your particular um, you know, local attorney's um, office. You know, if you don't in fact have the authority to represent um, all of the different branches of the, the county government, for instance, um, maybe there'd be a different uh, answer um, or at least a different inquiry. Yeah, that's, that's an important caveat. I think I was operating on the assumption that uh, it was a two agencies uh, that uh, did that had uh, as as their attorney, the attorney for the organization. Right. If those agencies have separate attorneys or have the right to have separate attorneys, then the answer could be different where there's a regular conflict. We have a little less than five minutes left. So uh, I know there are a lot of interesting questions out there. One of them was who, Bob, uh, Judge yeah. McDonald, you had said, who gets to speak for the government? And you know, I mean, that's one that's always been a bit troubling for me uh, in many respects. If you have a separation of powers, you know, is it the executive who gets to speak for the government? Is the, the legislative body, uh, is it in, are there internal entities within the uh, government that have that right? And if so, who has the authority to waive privilege uh, in speaking for the government? Can a, a, uh, you know, a conversations between the county executive or the mayor and their attorney uh, be uh, uh, privileged to only to the mayor or the, or the executive or are they privileged to the government and if they're privileged to the government does it mean that a council can waive those uh, discussions i think it's an interesting question i don't have an answer and that's one of the great things about ethics is that you know a lot of times we don't have to have answers we just have to recognize what the issues are it may be a, a little different in the i like I said, it's been a while since I had to think about it, but in, in the uh, state system, uh, the attorney general is an independently elected right. official who uh, by the constitution is in charge of the state's legal business. So it's almost like the attorney general has some independent authority to make a lot of decisions that a client might otherwise uh, be making. I'm going to change the topic very quickly just to hit on one point you had uh, talked about, and that's Rule 1.11. Yes. And uh, it, one of the things that uh, I think a lot of people don't recognize when reading that rule is that it applies to attorneys or lawyers who are in government employment or who are officers of the government but not necessarily working in the capacity of attorneys. So if you're working in the capacity of say the governor or the, a department head or a staff member, even though you're not acting as an attorney, the rule applies to you when you leave government service in terms of your law practice or when you go into government service in those, in those roles, even though you're, you, if you came from private practice, those rules would still apply to you while working as a government official. So you have to bear in mind that the rules apply are in at least the way they're written. Uh, uh -huh. And going back to the textualist arguments uh, or discussion earlier today, as written, it applies to an attorney who's working for the government, whether as an officer or an employee. And the other I think interesting issue is when you deal with conflicts, it, uh, the rules specifically provide that a matter is a matter as defined in a other ethical uh, rule that applies to you, a government, uh, whether it's a state government uh, ethics rules or a local government ethics rule, if a conflict exists, uh, then that would be something that rule 1.11 would extend to uh, in terms of determining conflict analysis. We haven't seen I, that I know of anything on rule 1.11 at the court. Right. Do, are there ethical, uh, are there There's, opinions from the MSBA uh, 
Ethics Committee on that? There on that? is at least one opinion that arose out of a uh, member of the of a county council who left, uh, who had had been. Uh, who had considered a zoning matter as a member of the council left and then wanted to represent an entity that had been part of that zoning uh, matter. And the Committee on Ethics concluded that the uh, council member was precluded from uh, participating unless with the consent of the governmental entity because 1.11 would apply, even though he was working as a council member or holding office as a council member uh -huh. and not working as an attorney. Hmm. So, uh, I, I, to me, it's interesting because I think a lot of people mistake the fact that uh, they they that while they're holding a, a position of govern in the government and not working as an attorney, that that rule might not apply to them, but it does. So, mm -hmm. At least as written. Of course, we'll give the Court of Appeals a chance to rule on that at some point in time, maybe. <laughs> So, uh, okay, I think we're, uh, we've reached our time. And I want to thank uh, Patrick and Judge McDonald for their, their participation in this event. Uh, as always, it was great. I know, uh, Judge McDonald, you were a member of the section before you went on the bench. And we really appreciate everything you've done for the section. Patrick is on our section council, does a terrific job. And uh, in participating and, and helping to guide the section, thank you very much. Thank you both. We're going to take a short break for until 3 p.m. when we're going to talk about policing in America. And obviously, that's a hot topic these days and one uh, where I think every person is concerned, whether you're a member of a section of state and local government law or you're just a person who is concerned about the uh, what's going on in the United States today. So uh, hopefully three o'clock, some great people uh, on the panel and look forward to seeing you back then. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks.
You are now live. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. We have a very distinguished panel to talk about uh, policing in America from reform to defunding is what I titled it. Uh, what we're going to do is we have uh, Ron Lewis, who's the city attorney for Houston, Pete Holmes, who's the city attorney for Seattle, Esteban Aguilar, who is the city attorney for Albuquerque, New Mexico. And we expect to have, and I see him now, Jim Johnson, who's corporation counsel for New York City. And what we're going to try to do is uh, talk about this issue for maybe 15, 20 minutes uh, a person, and then do some Q&A, sort of like we're sitting around a cocktail table where we can talk about what some of the issues are and how we might uh, resolve some of those issues or move in that direction. I thought we'd lead off with uh, Ron Lewis from Houston, and I'll tell you why. I, I was on a call similar to this with all the, the city attorneys from the top cities and mentioned something about the funding, and, and uh, Ron uh, spoke up and told me about uh, how uh, people in minority communities feel about the police and why it's so important for us to understand what those feelings are and you know how we might do something to improve that. Uh, Ron, I'm not sure that's exactly what you're gonna say today, but uh, I, I valued what you said then and it got me thinking and I'd like to start with you. So if you could tell us what police reform should look like and what it's looking like, that'd be great. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to share some thoughts with you. And it's always embarrassing when somebody says that I'm part of a distinguished panel. I think that must be a function of the distinctions of the, the distinguished nature of my co-panelists and not me, but uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to lead off the discussion as well. Uh, I'd like to start perhaps by, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna give you this conversation in a Houston context, obviously. Um, and, um, and to some degree in a state of Texas context. Uh, and as with all things, you know, there are political considerations that, uh, that color the policy issues. So um, after the George Floyd uh, tragedy, we had a number of people who called city council at, during our public session and they, they, they it's been an organized campaign to uh, ask city council to uh, defund the police. And this is sort of extraordinary because generally speaking, all of our electeds uh, talk about public safety as being the number one priority because that's what they hear about most when they're out among people. And so they never would have anticipated hearing in the course of, I think of their professional lives as elected officials, any, uh, any request to reduce funding for, um, for public safety. In Houston, um, Houston, the, the municipal corporation is about a $5 billion corporation. For the fourth largest city in the country, you, you can already guess that that is substantially in, in, inconsequential. I mean, it is, not, it is not an adequate amount of funding to run a, a $5 billion, uh, to run a, um, a corporation for the fourth largest city in the country covering more than 640 square miles. And of that 5 billion, roughly, roughly half goes to our enterprise funds, um, which are not funded from uh, ad valorem tax revenues. And so you have about uh, a little more than half, right? $2.7 million billion dollars that's available for police, fire, me, my department, the libraries, et cetera. Uh, again, a fairly small amount of money, and uh, the police and fire take up uh, over $1.4 billion of that uh, amount. So more than, um, more than 50% of the general fund dollars goes to police and fire. Uh, and when you want to begin to defund that effort, you have to consider it in, in, in context, because we only have about 5,200 police officers covering 640 square miles 
um, at 640 square miles makes us number nine or so by size. Um, but if you look at the top eight, none of them have the population that we have. And just for context, I mean, I think, um, I think uh, Mr. Johnson can confirm this. You know, New York City is roughly 300 square miles. It's got 38,000 police officers. Um, so again, if you talk about defunding the police uh, in this town, you're talking about uh, depriving people of access to, re to, to uh, service uh, because of the vast geography that must be covered and the limited number of people we have. Um, you know, right now we're the fourth largest city in the country, um, but but we're not we're not operating any sort of at any sort of operational level that's consistent with that. So um, our budget necessarily impacts this consideration, not not just because of the aggregate numbers I've given you, but because we operate under a revenue tax a revenue cap uh, that was imposed by a charter amendment. So there's a limit on how much we can raise taxes uh, and revenue year over year. And moreover, the state has now also imposed a revenue cap on, on cities. Um, and this year for, I think, um, uh, the fourth out of fifth year, five years since Mayor Turner has been elected, we're lowering the tax rate uh, because we're obliged to, we're required to lower the tax rate. And we had some state law officials come and and argue with us that we ought to lower it even more, which would have cost us about $30 million in tax revenue. And um, my department budget is about 40 million. So it's pretty much like saying you ought to get rid of lawyers um, to, uh, to lower that tax rate. Uh, or another way of looking at it is because the police and fire make up more than 50%, uh, that push to lower the tax rate is effectively seeking to defund the police because you cannot cut our budget without cutting police and fire. You can't cut it by $30 million without cutting police and fire. So oddly, the push for defunding comes from a variety of sources. It comes from people who are concerned about the nature of policing, and it comes as the uh, arguably unintended consequence of those people who continue to constrain the resources available uh, to cities in the state of Texas. So, um, the citizens called and asked us to cut HPD after the George Floyd incident or to defund it. But some acknowledged that the idea wasn't really to get rid of police so much as it was uh, to establish a new set of policing priorities. Um, and it wasn't really uh, largely communicated as a Black Lives Matter push, uh, although it was obviously part of the post-George Floyd uh, uprising. <clears throat> I'm, I'm pleased to say that largely in, in our town, we didn't have violence and, uh, of any consequence, and we didn't have any property damage, and we didn't have sustained, uh, uh, sustained uh, destructive activity. Rather, we had a lot of very positive and constructive um, uh, rallying and marching in which our elected officials participated as well as other civic leaders. Um, but nevertheless, there continues to be a strong desire on the part of the community to, um, to recognize now what our elected officials have never heard in the past, which is you know, there needs to be a different approach taken to policing. Again, I don't think people have rejected the idea that police are necessary for public safety. Uh, but the question is on the on the table is, uh, do we go about providing public safety in the right way? Um, so that rethinking uh, has begun in the city of Houston, and we've begun to um, to act on what to do to, to to recognize that there's a need to do something. So what what are we going to do? Well, first I think we're going to recognize that for those interested uh, in this problem, we can think about and describe public safety in new and different ways. Uh, some of it really isn't terribly new. These are, you know, most, we've been slicing bread for a long time. It's just 
how much are we able to prioritize some of those good ideas that have come out in the past. And so and now I think there's less danger on the part of electeds in talking about um, how public safety is provided for uh, when you go out and you talk to the, the citizenry. Uh, and then, then, you know, once you recognize that you have that opportunity to use a new, a new vocabulary, then you've got to act on it in concrete ways. Um, but you've got to be alert as well. You've got to be smart about it. You've got to be alert to the risks. So one of our sister cities, Austin, um, went about the process of de literally defunding their police department drawing the ire of our state government. And uh, our governor has promised to take up legislation to take resources away from that city, constrain their ability to raise revenue um, and literally as punishment for um, what he saw as an inappropriate public policy priority. But again, once you take money away from the cities, you, you perhaps uh, have the unintended consequence of defunding the police. What we've done here in Houston um, is uh, post George Floyd, George Floyd takes really three prominent forms. First, um, the mayor implemented executive order 1-67, which reforms and, and puts into city policy, not just into police department policy how we will use force in the field. So it requires a, a new and considered focus on de-escalation. It imposes limitations on the circumstances under which deadly force may be used. It bans chokeholds. Uh, it all but bans no-knock warrants. It, it requires officers to intercede if they see somebody else violating policy, other officers violating policy or people's rights. Uh, and it, it starts us down a path that other advocacy groups therefore have, have called upon to change the nature of, of policing. We also uh, implemented another executive order uh, where we uh, opted into uh, the opportunity to engage in site and release programs uh, rather than jailing people for some specific offenses that the state enables cities to uh, take advantage of. But most significantly, the mayor um, brought together a task force on police reform. Uh, it was an extremely diverse group of people from all walks of life. Uh, and it has delivered since it was formed in roughly June a 153 page report with well in excess of 100 specific policy recommendations. And these touch on everything from community policing to the independent oversight process, power dynamics between citizens and the police, crisis intervention, field readiness, uh, and improving our training and, and uh, expectations and the communication of those expectations with officers. And we're presently working through those 100 plus recommendations. In my department, for example, we're drafting a new uh, policy, a new independent police oversight board uh, policy uh, for consideration by the administration. And I know that uh, the chief of police and others in the administration are looking at all of the recommendations. I think the mayor takes each and every one of them seriously. So, um, from an institutional standpoint, uh, that's, that's how the city has reacted to both the citizenry and the, the governmental body has reacted to, um, to the defunding movement and the George Floyd um, incident to this point. I expect that we will be held to account by the task force and by the citizens uh, if we do not act on uh, a substantial portion of their recommendations. Um, and I expect that uh, if we don't think differently about how we engage in policing, we will be, there'll be a greater, a large group of citizens who express their disappointment uh, when next they have the opportunity at the poll. Um, 
as I mentioned, this wasn't really uh, thought of as a Black Lives Matter type uh, of response, um, but it is nevertheless a recognition that uh, if we're going to provide for the safety of the public, all of the public must feel safe. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Uh, we're going to uh, we're going to go to Pete Holmes, who's city attorney in Seattle. Uh, by way of brief introduction, uh, before he was elected city attorney, Pete was uh, involved in police reform as the head of the citizens uh, panel that oversaw the police. Pete, you're on mute. If you could get off of that uh, and start, thank you. Thank you, you Ron. Bet. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, thank you, Ron. I wanted to make a parting comment at the end of your presentation that uh, I continue to covet your chief of police. Uh, I've tried to corner him a couple of times to see if he was interested in coming to Seattle when we were in the middle of, of a search process at the time for our, you our chief. That. Uh, you're, that. Very, you're very fortunate. Um, and I know he's fortunate to have you for a legal representative. Um, <clears throat> I'm also proud to be joined here with Jim Johnson, uh, you know, a, a fellow uh, uh, top legal officer for an anarchist jurisdiction. Uh, and I want to hail to everyone from the anarchist jurisdiction of Seattle. Um, it's, uh, it's been a wonderful collaboration, uh, Jim's office and mine, in uh, bringing forward the lawsuit against the Trump administration uh, a little over a week ago uh, to try and address some of the funding cuts that have been proposed for this illegal uh, designation of being anarchist jurisdictions. So I also want to try and encapsulate very quickly uh, Seattle's experience for the benefit of, of everyone in the audience. Uh, that means that we've had eight years under a consent decree. Um, and <clears throat> I'd like to bring forward where things looked uh, at the time that George Floyd was murdered in May. Uh, because we're now up on 150 days of protests. And so there's the snapshot of how much had been achieved by the SPD um, under eight years of federal oversight, and now where things stand. The, uh, <clears throat> I was in my first term, I'm now in my third term in office, but I was in my first term when John T. Williams, uh, a Native American woodcarver, was shot to death by a Seattle police officer in August of 2010. And that led to calls by a, a wide ranging uh, group of community activist organizations to, uh, to uh, launch an investigation, a patterns and practices investigation by the Department of Justice. Uh, <clears throat> DOJ did in fact announce that investigation in March of 2011. And in one of the shortest investigations on record, they announced their findings in December of 2011. And among other things, the, the pivotal finding back at that snapshot in time was that serious uses of force by SPD exceeded constitutional norms in at least 20% of the time. Uh, of the time. Uh, and that was <clears throat> to this day, a controversial finding. And rather than admitting to that or uh, conceding those terms, the city did nonetheless enter into a consent decree with the Department of Justice uh, we joke sometimes now, it's been so long, that the only signatories to that July 2012 um, consent decree still in office are Judge Robart and myself. And uh, we have been through, I'm on, I'm on mayor number five at this point, if you count the small interim mayors um, that, have, that have come along. And um, uh, the, the, my present mayor is... The, the former U.S. attorney who also had signed the consent decree, but as a plaintiff. <clears throat> I also, uh, one quick parting comment about the earlier presentation this morning, I listened with interest about the role of the government lawyer. And I've got to say that one of the things that has been so difficult in as, as being counsel of record on the Seattle's consent decree is the notion, as Judge Robart continually reminds us, that this is a two-party case, the city of Seattle and the United States of America. And Holmes, you represent one of those parties. And <clears throat> I, would, I would give worlds to help 
uh, divine what the position of the city of Seattle is at any given time with regard to police reform. So it's a challenge that I know all of my other uh, city attorneys face and corporation counsel because there are, if there's anything that people have uh, strong views about, it's policing. So <clears throat> um, we did make a lot of progress. The consent decree was entered, as I said, in July, in July of 2012. And then by January of 2018, Judge Robart found that we had achieved full and effective compliance of all of the requirements of the consent decree. And it remained then, that, that triggered a second phase, a maintenance phase, two years where we had to maintain full and effective compliance. Uh, not too long into that, the judge did find that we had fallen out of compliance. Uh, it had to do with accountability measures and in particular one egregious case of an officer who punched a handcuffed woman um, in the back of his police car and fractured uh, her skull and uh, only to be fired and to have an arbitrator uh, reinstate the officer. Uh, my office has since uh, had the uh, amazing result of overturning that arbitration award, but it is still winding its way through our state courts of appeal. But in May of this year, just a few weeks before the George Floyd tragedy, we told the city the following, uh, we, the, excuse me, the city told the court the following, SPD is a transformed organization. Force used by SPD today represents a night and day contrast to the practices documented by DOJ back in 2011. This case began because DOJ found that 20% of SPD's uses of force were unconstitutional. DO <clears throat> today, as a result of the consent decree reforms, more than 99% of force used by SPD officers complies with policy and a, a standard that exceeds the constitutional uh, minimums. And there has been a 60% reduction in overall serious use of force. Any pattern or practice of excessive force that existed before has been eliminated. And I wanted to point out uh, that one of the things that we're particularly proud of that seems to be torn from the headlines today remains to be a challenge was in our crisis response, crisis intervention work. That was a model, still remains a model for the country. And it is an area where just, um, I, I am personally proud, the entire city's uh, uh, proud of the enormous strides that have been made to actually recognize that people in a mental health crisis um, are, uh, there are much better, safer approaches to dealing with those situations in Seattle. Police department has learned that there's a crisis response team and all patrol officers undergo minimal amount of crisis intervention training and it has really paid enormous dividends. On top of that, we have an amazing accountability structure. There's the Office of Police Accountability that uh, investigates uh, instances of individual uh, officer misconduct allegations. There is a new inspector general who's responsible for looking more broadly at operations of the department and policy uh, that, uh, that is implemented by the chief of police. And, uh, and then finally, the, the, the uh, vital, critically important voice of the community is heard through the community police commission. And we have a very active community police commission. Now, ironically, as I said at the beginning, I technically represent all of these entities, including the mayor, and the city council. Now, if you fast forward very quickly, uh, that was eight years encapsulated. Uh, then came May 25th, uh, the murder of George Floyd. By that Friday night, Seattle was burning. Uh, six police cars were destroyed, were burned uh, that evening. Uh, there was looting, uh, rioting, and uh, things really, really became un unhinged pr very quickly. Um, I wanna fast forward because some of this is uh, triggering a little bit of PTSD, but it has been, been a summer uh, alongside the, the, the uh, pandemic for Seattle that has been a, ver a, a big, big challenge. <clears throat> By June 3rd, uh, this motion to terminate the sustainment plan under the consent decree and essentially wrap up the consent decree, I unilaterally withdrew that motion on June 3rd. 
because of the escalating tensions in the street. Um, and a question for all, why was SPD responding to the protests as uh, with, with such stern measures? Uh, these are, as I said at the time, when I withdrew the motion, I said that SPD's accountability system is about to undergo its most rigorous test ever. And that is still going on today uh, as we start to review what became by late June, some 19,000 complaints of police misconduct following the, the handling of the protests in the streets. Um, you may be familiar, I was, it's no laughing matter, of course, about the anarchist jurisdiction designation, but a lot of what happened this summer, 99% of what happened this summer is the, is the basis for the uh, administration's illegal actions. But SPD was forced at one point, as similar to what had happened in Minneapolis, to abandon uh, one of its precincts, uh, the, the East Precinct, we have five precincts, and um, it was uh, a, a state of confusion, frankly. Uh, I think that the police were frankly quite overwhelmed with the, uh, the breadth of the response, the anger, and any notion that this was anything but organic and, and a, a response that, that really came from all sectors of society was quickly dispelled. Uh, this was uh, in large respects duplicated across the country, but it seems like in Seattle, locally, of course, it always feels worse, but it was pretty powerful here. Um, by the time of, uh, by June 9, uh, the city had been sued by the Black Lives Matter organization here, Seattle King County, for using excessive force in these protests. And uh, we did stipulate to a temporary restraining order on the use of some crowd control weapons and techniques. Um, the following day uh, is when the uh, administration first started, Donald Trump in particular, uh, tweeting, uh, calling out uh, our mayor and uh, our governor and uh, uh, claiming that our, we had lost control of our city and was threatening to take action if we hadn't uh, gotten it under control. Uh, a general strike was called by Black Lives Matter on June 12th. Um, and... Uh, it was, uh, again, became a uh, grist for the media mill, including doctored photos on Fox News, pictures from Minneapolis that were uh, aired uh, on Fox News under the banner that this is unrest in Seattle. Um, but nonetheless, by June 6, this Capitol Hill, this six block area that was called earlier Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone or CHAZ became, was renamed the CHOP. Uh, Capitol Hill occupied uh, protests. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there were some shootings and the like that unfolded afterwards. Uh, it was all a very difficult situation that was facing our police department and our city government. And, uh, uh, you know, I think it, it helped to bring in sharp relief a lot of the problems that we continued to have. One thing happened on June 17, and now I want to get close to uh, wrapping up here uh, that I that I want to leave for the listeners to, to be considering is the the notion that um, our police union, uh, the, the rank and file union is called SPOG, the Seattle Police Officers Guild. And then we also have a union for lieutenants and captains that's called the Seattle Police Management Association. Uh, on June 17, uh, it was almost unheard of our largest single local labor organization, the King County Labor Council, ejected SPOG from membership and called on them to, uh, to make changes to their contract with the city that would address accountability concerns. Con the same concerns, frankly, that Judge Robart had expressed uh, after having initially found that the city was in full and effective compliance. And so as we face this coming session, our, the next session of our legislature begins in Olympia in January, and uh, the potential for police reform, including organized uh, uh, collective bargaining rights under state law, uh, would presumably be on the table. We'll see. But uh, in any event, uh, that's, that's what lies ahead for us 
uh, in, in Olympia. And in the meantime, uh, I was only half joking earlier that it's been full employment for my office with the number of lawsuits that we are defending both in state court and in federal court. Uh, I think all of us are holding our collective breaths uh, that next week might uh, change the tenor of some of this litigation, the outcome of the national election. But uh, we don't have the luxury as counsel for, for uh, America's cities to, uh, to rest our hopes on the outcome of an election in the future. We have to continue to meet our challenges every day. And the police are at the front lines uh, in all of this. So with that, I look forward to Q&A and uh, we'll turn it back to Chuck. Thank you, Pete. I very much appreciate it. And I know that, uh, you know, the city of Seattle is well represented uh, in you. I'm going to turn it now to Steve Aguilar, who is the city attorney for Albuquerque, where they've made a number of uh, strides towards dealing with the issue of police reform. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chuck. And uh, it is I want to reiterate uh, the comments made by my colleagues that it is a privilege and an honor to be here today uh, speaking with you all. Uh, so what I want to talk about briefly today is sort of the, the strides that are being made in Albuquerque to reform or to, I'm sorry, transform. I think it's important the, the way that we refer to these processes. Um, that we are transforming the department uh, and its policies that have had a disparate impact on minority communities, uh, as well as how some of those seem to be working and, and uh, or not working. So uh, part of that requires a little bit of history, much like Seattle, New Orleans, Newark, uh, the city of Albuquerque is under a consent decree resulting from a problematic uh, officer involved shootings between 2006 and 2010. During that time, there were more than 37 officer involved shootings um, and other uh, uses of force. Uh, the city council of Albuquerque reached out and asked for, asked the Department of Justice for an investigation into those uses of force. Um, in 2012, the Department of Justice began uh, investigating. Uh, it completed that investigation two years later in 2014, um, reflecting that the city of Albuquerque and the police department had a pattern in practice of improper un or unlawful uses of force. Uh, in October 2015, the city entered into a settlement agreement, a consent decree. We call it the CASA. So even though we're in New Mexico, uh, <laughs> it's, it's an acronym, but we're going to, when you hear that today, that's what I'm referring to as our consent decree. Understandably, um, there was a, a history of trauma that was felt by our community as a result of those incidents, those and other incidents. Uh, and what's important is while our community did not this summer, did not see the same type and extent of protests that uh, we saw across the country, uh, we were there four years ago, um, really triggered by the shooting of a of a man who was suffering from mental illness and homelessness named James Boyd, who was in the foothills, uh, and that was captured on video. Uh, as a result, um, from that moment, um, you know, the city of Albuquerque really began focusing on its initiatives, and it's the critical component of that uh, is community-oriented policing, uh, which is a critical piece. I don't want to I want to stress how critical that is towards any transformation process. Um, the city of Albuquerque adopted the community oriented policing program, the COP program as we call it, is one of, one of our key strategies for achieving success in this process. Uh, it is a vital tool for resolving problems that are identified uh, through strategies that are, that are approved not only by the monitoring team in the courts, but through the, all of those policies and everything that we do uh, gets viewed from a community lens. And we have multiple uh, entities as part of the lawsuit process who are involved and engaged in, in, in those measures. So I'll get into those here in a minute. Um, as part of the CASA process, the city is required to provide uh, 16 hours of training uh, on those on those measures, but frankly, the, the, this department is doing much more than that. Um, 
the strategy though is, is that it's a community centric philosophy, right? Which provides for input and collaboration with those key stakeholders, many or most of whom have suffered trauma, tra trauma as a result of over policing or their own interactions. Uh, and the goal is to always partner with the focus on specific problem solving. There are three real components to that, which are community partnerships, organizational transformation, and then really getting into the problem solving level. So what, what, our, what our team is doing, uh, when I say our team, I mean the Albuquerque Police Department. Uh, and in, since I have taken over, since I started this job uh, two and a half years ago, they are driving all of these measures. Uh, I wanna make clear that it is, it is the women and men of the Albuquerque Police Department who have taken the lead in rebuilding and repairing those relationships with our community. And it's for the key reasons that I'll, that I'll cover briefly. Um, really establishing the legitimate, the relevance, legitimacy, and importance of those community relationships is key. Um, as we, we teach and, and the department teaches that the United States exists because we, we uh, as a result of the, the consent of the governed, the police are allowed to police, um, but you cannot uh, maintain those relationships without adequately, um, you know, building and in, in building on those levels of trust. Uh, sorry, one second. Developing partnerships is also key. And so um, as part of that, the city of Albuquerque also has established what are called community policing councils. I think uh, Mr. Holmes will be familiar with this because it's a model that we, we took, I think from Seattle. Um, but the, the way that our community is spread out for law enforcement purposes, we have six area commands uh, and there are six uh, different what are called community policing councils within those area commands and the purpose of those councils really is to help um, foster better policing and community practices uh, with those relationships with those police who are in those area commands. Uh, it is not a police oversight group or agency, but they are tasked with helping the department to find ways to improve policing and improve policies in each of those area commands. And that's important because one area command will have different issues that may affect it than another area command. Uh, and so building and, and building those relationships, so those members of the community uh, trust the department and trust trust the work that we are doing enough to be able to come forward and address those issues in a way that we can have a lot, have a, uh, a collaborative, uh, productive dialogue um, to, to make sure that we're one, understanding what is important to them, uh, as well as how we can work on resolving that or, or resolving those issues. Each of those stakeholders have a unique perspective that they've developed uh, and they have valuable input. Um, and so, the, the police department has really uh, focused on ensuring that they that we're listening as much as we are uh, acting. Um, stakeholders are also a critical component of the CASA process, uh, which include multiple amici um, that actually act as almost as parties in the lawsuit and they're involved at every stage whether it's policy development uh policy review because every one of our policies goes through a review every six months because we can always improve even though we have great policies we can always do better um, but those components of the amici are, are groups like apd forward which uh compo is comprised of the aclu of new mexico uh, Albuquerque Healthcare for the Homeless and various faith-based organizations, uh, the Community Coalition, which is uh, which is our folks in our community who have had negative interactions with policing or come from communities who have suffered from a disparate impact due to policing, uh, because it's important that we're hearing those vo those those hearing what is important to them and their experiences, so we understand uh, really in in almost a restorative justice type of fashion, um, what they've gone through. And only then will we be able to better help and, and partner uh, with them moving forward. As well as critically, uh, one of the, the most important components in our process has been the creation of the Mental Health Response and Advisory Committee, uh, which has, again, members, including clinicians, um, folks in the community, members of the public who provide input and review on APD's response for um, those suffering from mental health or crisis. 
Um, the key takeaway across all of these, though, is that in order to establish trust, uh, any department must have increased contacts, visible improvements, and, share, and shared information. Um, that will result, if you're doing it right, in increasing public trust, um, ensuring that community needs and priorities are, are also being met, um, providing it, increased information and cooperation uh, within that community. Uh, but the other impacts are it actually has reduced our calls for service. Um, it has improved the ability of our officers um, to uh, operate in, our, in those communities. Uh, it has significantly reduced the, the uses of force. Um, and really the, the goal of all of this is to reduce actual crime, but that key piece is that trust, you know, uh, our, our couple of our favorite phrases are that uh, community policing will be successful when police are viewed uh, as of the community and not for the community. Um, because as, uh, as a scholar once said, police are, are the public and the public are the police. The police being only members of the public who are paid to give full time and attention to duties and come in on every citizen to in the interest of community welfare in existence. So um, with all that being said, there's lots that we are working on. I'm happy to answer any specific questions that we can, but uh, this is a process and it's collaborative uh, and it's always ongoing. There, I understand that we have these benchmarks when you know, we hopefully one day we'll file the dismissal paperwork for that lawsuit, but the work that we are doing must continue on well beyond that in order for our community and for us to, to deliver the best uh, police department um, that frankly all of us deserve because I'm a member of this community as well. So thank you for your time and I'll turn over to Chuck. Thank you, Steve. I really appreciate it. And obviously the city of Albuquerque is well served with you as their city attorney. And now let me go to Jim Johnson, who's Corporation Counsel for the City of New York. A, uh, I, I won't call you an anarchist city, Jim. Uh, someone else has done that. Uh, but uh, obviously, the City of New York is the largest city in our country. And uh, as Ron mentioned, has over 38,000 police officers. So, Jim, I know you have uh, a lot of tough responsibilities. Thanks, Chuck, and um, it, I'm really happy to be able to address you from the piles of rubble um, surrounding us here. The, um, um, you know, as Pete said, it's it's actually not a laughing and laughing matter in many respects, but one has to keep a sense of humor um, in dealing with some of the um, the issues that the administration has been tossing our way. So what I wanted to do was offer two lenses on the issues of reform. Um, uh, Immediately prior to being uh, named as Corporation Counsel, I was a senior fellow at the Brennan Center. And while there, I was part of a group called Law Enforcement Leaders to Reduce Crime and Incarceration. I had been Undersecretary of the Treasury overseeing the ATF, Secret Service, and the Customs Service in, um, in the, during the Clinton years. And um, in 2015, I was one of the founding members of a group called Law Enforcement Leaders to Reduce Crime and Incarceration. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what that group was doing, because I think to me, it's an, an example of uh, the hope for um, reform from within. And then because my department includes um, the Family Court Division, which is in charge of uh, juvenile adjudications, um, I wanted to talk, really drill down closely on one area of juvenile justice reform. So first, um, the law enforcement leaders. Um, our thinking at the, the Brennan Center um, was at the time in 2014-2015 that um, we could push forward reform, but uh, change takes a couple of things. You have to have clear objectives, you have to have um, allies, and you have to be opportunistic. And um, while at the center we had clear objectives, it was important for us um, as a nonpartisan organization to see what allies there were, what alliances that could help push forward reform. Uh, and what, once we started to have that look, that we could form a bipartisan um, and nonpartisan group of law enforcement leaders who were uh, proponents of change. Um, we had our first meeting in my, um, my office. I was actually a partner at 
a large law firm at the time. And um, it was one of those few moments where I had to talk to the general counsel of, of, the, of the firm and say, you know, is it okay if I have a bunch of guys with guns coming in? Um, and um, he suggested to me that it would have been better to ask before they were actually arriving, but it was fine. And when we sat around that conference table, um, there were about 45 of us. Uh, many were still actively in their positions as either prosecutors or as law enforcement leaders. Um, I remember one um, sheriff saying, um, I believe it was a sheriff from Colorado, um, saying, you know, I am housing tons of people. And at some point we have to recognize that what we're doing is nuts. Um, and he brought the perspective, um, he articulated a perspective that led to essentially five pillars for the law enforcement leaders. One was, um, and it's embedded in the name, reducing unnecessary incarceration by focusing on the elimination of mandatory minimums and developing alternatives to incarceration. Two uh, was increasing mental health and drug treatment available for individuals rather than trying to throw law enforcement to solve problems that are better addressed through other social tools. Um, three, um, and I think Esteban really much uh, pre, uh, gave a preview of the importance of this, was bolstering supporting community um, policing. Uh, four was improving juvenile justice, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second when I talk about what we're doing here in my department. And the fifth was really preserving and expanding efforts to, um, to reduce recidivism. Um, all of those um, could be the subject of much lengthier talks. They are actually all in a report that was recently issued by the law enforcement leaders. It's called Ensuring Justice and Public Safety. I commend it to you and you can find it on their, uh, on the website, which is lawenforcementleaders.org. Um, so I wanna to turn to juvenile justice, which is really the, um, one of the areas that's within my, my ambit. Um, we actually have now 35,000 or so um, um, officers and administrative personnel within the NYPD. It's actually, it's force strength has come down uh, significantly. And there are lots of issues, in, uh, including consent decrees um, and independent investigations uh, in connection with the, the protests that would be grist for our mill. But I want to focus on um, juvenile justice because there's a through line but from that to the work that the law enforcement leaders highlighted as really being important for uh, change. So, my department has a family uh, court division last, uh, in 2018, we um, adjudicated about 2,800 um, cases, which is a tremendous uh, number. Um, but that number actually increased in 2019 because the, um, our jurisdiction increased. Um, in the years before that, the state legislature passed what we refer to as the Raise the Age Act, um, which raised the age of adult um, responsibility from 16 to 18. As a result, many more um, juvenile cases came into my office in 2019, as I said. Well, um, as I was about to say, the number is net was about 4,600 cases. Um, and our mandate is, um, is I wouldn't say unique, but it is it definitely drives our approach. As a matter of legislative concern, we have basically two core functions that we're supposed to serve or balance in our cases. One um, is ensuring the safety of the community, but that's actually just the second. The first is uh, making sure that the adjudication um, is done in the best interest of the child and we do the work necessary to be done to provide um, a set of treatments, remedial steps that could restore a child to um, a path that was productive. Um, one of the reasons behind the Raise the Age legislation was uh, the finding by our legislature and by advocates that the sooner a child becomes enmeshed in the criminal justice system, 
the more likely it is that um, he or she will have many, many more additional encounters and essentially they will, their lives will be set off in a, on an unproductive and um, destructive path. Uh, and so one of the things that we have done as we've received more and more of these cases is that we have doubled down on efforts to create a different uh, path. Um, and uh, that involves uh, two things. One is diversion and the other is restorative justice practices. Um, but let's focus uh, for the time that we have on diversion. Uh, so, um, Basically, the, our view has been that um, when we end up with detention dispositions of young people, as I alluded to before, um, um, the trajectory of their lives uh, is changed significantly and largely downward. Um, what we now try to do is fairly early on um, in two different ways, both by the Department of Probation when a, when a juvenile is arrested and by my office, make a determination about whether or not a young person is, is uh, an appropriate candidate for diversion, which means that the case against them would be dismissed. Um, the record would actually be um, sealed, um, but they would actually be required to undergo uh, treatment. So it's non-custodial. Uh, and it would involve treatment. Um, in many instances, uh, when there is a mandate like that, um, the, the, it's, it is input determined. You know, success is, is, is determined by how many people you actually refer to. So the fact that we, um, over the last few years, have actually doubled the number of people that have been uh, diverted some people might take that as a sign, uh, pure and simple of success. We don't. Uh, instead, our view is actually based on the outcome of uh, individuals' lives. Uh, and we do a lot of preparation to, to make sure that um, our judgments about who is uh, going to be um, received a um, uh, diversion um, are sound and the, um, the programs into which kids are placed are effective. Uh, so over the last few years, what we have done is gone undertaken fairly intensive training of our personnel to make sure that um, they have the right tools um, to make judgments about um, who should and who should not be diverted and what programs are appropriate for them. Um, so, we have a process for evaluating community-based service providers um, and making sure that we have an ongoing process of outreach um, to uh, the many service providers that we have in the city of New York. Um, uh, and as we were ramping up with Raise the Age, as I mentioned, we, we have more cases that require adjudication. As we got more cases, we ended up getting uh, a commensurate amount of um, resources. Uh, and we brought on people that we trained um, in a variety of areas. They had, we had recruited from service providers for one, so that they were not, um, the, the folks who came on board were familiar with uh, treatment for young people in need. Um, so they brought in people with experience, um, as well as people uh, experienced in the not-for-profit sector, as well as people with experience um, within uh, law enforcement. Um, uh, and we focused on areas of mental health, um, providing training for them uh, so that they could understand juvenile mental health issues, um, substance abuse issues, child and evidence of child abuse and neglect. Um, as many, if not all of you know, the chances of uh, children um, who end up in the criminal justice system often have had um, adverse childhood experiences, commonly referred to as ACEs. Um, it's important for our teams to be able to identify ACEs do a, um, and make adjustments based on the sort of challenges that a young person uh, has undergone before they've ended up in the, and with engagement um, with the criminal justice system. Um, and so the um, that has been part of our uh, preparation 
for a robust diversion program, making sure that our personnel is well trained. But then the second piece is um, since we are not actually providing the treatment, we are referring people to providers, is putting in place a process for evaluating the effectiveness of, of, of providers, um, checking in to make sure that at the end of the day, um, the children are getting the, the treatment, as we call it, that they need um, to set themselves to get set on another path. Um, one of the clear indicators for us as to whether or not um, it's been working and the matches are right is that we have many instances of young people who have decided that what they should do after their period of um, prescribed treatment or engagement with the social service providers um, has expired, many of our uh, young people, many of our responding juveniles um, will stay in those, those programs and keep moving forward. Um, I think that given what we know about the impact of engagement with the criminal justice system, um, and given what we have heard, the combined experience of leaders like the law enforcement leaders group who focus on criminal justice refor reform um, and on juvenile justice issues, it is very important as we move forward to, um, as on a national level, to focus on issues of diversion and make sure those programs are evaluated based on outcome and not simply the fact that you have uh, shunted a, a young person who may have gone through many other programs and not been served well um, into just one more program. Uh, from my perspective, given the fact that some, many of our people decide to, to stay in uh, with it, whatever programs they're assigned to, this is a sign of, of hope. Um, this is a sign, this is an area of, I think, tremendous opportunity. Um, and I think that um, if, it's a, if um, cities have an opportunity to build um, diversion programs and to focus in this area, the, the benefits could in fact be effect, um, felt for generations. And with that, Chuck, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I, I very much value what you had to say, and I'd like to try to throw it out to the group a little bit. Is uh, One of the things that I believe coronavirus has done to us, other than uh, keep us from meeting in person, is it has, uh, to some extent, emptied out jails and uh, some of the other holding facilities, whether they're prisons or whatever. Uh, how has that affected public safety? And does that point to any ideas for further reform in not incarcerating people for things that, uh, if you can't keep them in jail for because of coronavirus, maybe you don't have to keep them in jail at all? Uh, I don't know who wants to lead off on that, but Jim, you're the only one unmuted right now, so I'll let you start. I'll be real quick. Um, so one of the, when uh, in uh, March and early April, when coronavirus was, um, um, was really ravaging New York and the, um, there was a tremendous amount of concern, um, Mayor de Blasio and his team um, uh, really focused on reducing the jail population at Rikers. Um, there was, it was expected that there would lead to, that would lead to a spike in crime. It did not. Um, and um, it has now led many of us to ask the same sort of question that you've asked, Chuck, um, which is maybe we didn't need to have so many people in jail. The other thing that the, the virus forced us to do is to think through better ways of processing young people rather than taking them to say a central um, location where they would be mixed in um, or at least have some interaction with adult um, populations, we were able to do many more presentments by video. And um, uh, so we've learned something from coronavirus, not only in the policy issue, but also on the, the, practical, the practice areas um, that I think we're gonna put to good use. Uh, can I call on one of our other presenters? Pete, looks like you're unmuted, and then Ron. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Chuck. And I, I uh, appreciated that Jim went into some of the criminal side of uh, these police reforms. Uh, you know, as prosecutor, uh, that's been something that that we were looking at before 
the uh, George Floyd protests started. And as you pointed out, uh, uh, Jim, analogous to New York, our county executive started emptying the, the county jail where Seattle houses its inmates uh, as rapidly as we could out of fears for uh, super spreader events within, within that facility. And uh, the county prosecutor and I uh, immediately started to say, we need to track this, you know, that we need to understand, can we, can we watch what the jail population looks like as it starts to plummet and then compare that and make sure we're tracking uh, crime stats. Now, the protests threw, you know, uh, a, a, a different uh, wrinkle into all of this. And so I think the ability to, to track what might have been ambient level crime levels uh, has been, it's quite difficult now, given the large numbers of arrests that we've had for protests. So, uh, but, it, but you're right, it, it gave a lot of, um, a, a lot of support to the alternatives to incarceration that we've been looking at. Uh, I too, Jim, I think that's where you and I met was probably through law enforcement leaders at the, the, the Brennan Center. But um, you know, we've been trying to do it. And I would point out that independent of the protests, by the way, the county prosecutor and I have been focused resolutely on not prosecuting uh, any peaceful protesters. It, it's easier said than done as you start to examine body cams and all of that. But even before the protests, uh, for instance, I'm very proud of, we have a pre-filing diversion program where I have dedicated prosecutors that are looking at cases that we would otherwise file, uh, but that uh, indicate that, you know, perhaps a restorative justice model intervention would get a, yield a better result. And so we contracted with a community-based organization called Choose 180. And in the three years that we've been referring uh, defendants to that program, we're well over 90% do not re-offend. Re That's a re recidivism rate that everyone should take notice of. Um, and we're completely hands off. Like Jim, you know, we make the determination to extend the offer uh, and, and it's only for those cases that we would otherwise prosecute. And, um, and we'll send them there. And if they take us up on it, the results have been just, just staggering. So all of these things are taking on a new lease on life in the post COVID world. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. It's also linked uh, inextricably to the whole defund police movement. Um, because the, the, the notion being, and I'll stop with this, is that what, what's fundamentally okay about the defund movement is the notion that you want to upstream it. We, we're all learning that you know, it's far better to get involved with an intervention early on before someone crosses the threshold of criminal behavior and try to address needs, uh, concerns, uh, illnesses, uh, whatever. And uh, the, you get much better outcomes. It's much more cost effective because frankly, the criminal justice system is an extremely inefficient, poor provider of basic social services. Uh, it is not cut out for that. It doesn't work. And eventually we're going to learn that if we keep doubling down either on the war on drugs or this notion, this addiction to calling a cop for everything that goes wrong, we're going to learn that it is not the most effective way to make your communities safer. So this is an opportunity. It's uh, and I and I'm really uh, I'm really hopeful that we'll use it to good advantage. All right, uh, Ron. Let me uh, call on you, and then Steve. I'm going to run back to you to ask you a question about some of what you brought up uh, about the changes and or transformation there in Albuquerque. Great. <clears throat> Well, I, I wanted to make a couple of observations on your question. First of all, the city of Houston doesn't have a jail, so we can't let people out. Um, the county and the state are in control of these processes. And, and but I think the, you know, <clears throat> intellectually, one of the problems is the political component that infects all analysis. So, you know, we had the governor uh, complain about the fact that uh, a judge held a person in contempt for violating one of his orders uh, with respect to COVID-related behavior, closing of a business. And then that judge, because 
the lady was just obstinate, um, held her in contempt and put her in jail. And the, um, the, the governor went after the judge, the uh, lieutenant governor gave money to get her out of jail, even though the whole thing arose around enforcing his order. Um, on the other hand, the governor says, I don't want to see people go to jail because, you know, you county officials, some of you county officials have been saying we ought to let some offenders out of jail because uh, people get sick in jail. Uh, and so rather than having a sort of, uh, I think, coherent and rational discussion around the issue, you end up with a lot of politics. In my view, you know, you don't have a one size fits all fit for this particular problem. So the answer isn't, do I let everybody out or do I put everybody in? And, you know, as it affects cities, it leads to a certain amount of um, uh, vacillation on our part. I mean, we have, we've done, as I mentioned, the site and release program, and yet we just had to use uh, coronavirus relief fund money to fund police overtime because we have had a material um, uptick in uh, criminal activity. Uh, which we associate with the fact that there's so many people at home and the anxiety and stress is associated with um, the effect of the coronavirus on all of us. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have a solution for you. I mean, as a, as a personal matter, I'd like to see as few people in jail as possible. But um, on the other hand, uh, you know, I've, I've also had people call me who were filing lawsuits against the county uh, and making arguments ultimately that said that, you know, you shouldn't, certain people should never ever be put in jail. And if you're not going to ever put anybody in jail, I'm not quite sure how you can ever enforce law. So it just, it's not a, I think, I think there has to be a more reasoned discussion around the issue uh, as opposed to taking the easy route of saying one way or the other that there is a simple solution. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Steve, before I jump to you, Jim had a clarification he wanted to make on some statistics. You're on mute, Jim. There you go. Very quickly, when I was referring to or the lack of a spike in um, criminal activity, it was in the me period immediately after we were releasing nonviolent folks from, um, from the jails. During the summer, we have definitely experienced a higher number of, of homicide shootings in the city and homicides. So it, it actually has, like many other cities around the country, we have seen sort of a rise, but nothing that would correlate strongly to the, the release of individuals um, during the, the March, April period of COVID-19. Yeah, I, I would tend to think that the people that are being released are not the people that are uh, people that are in someone's mind likely to be committing homicides. Uh, they're more likely the minor offenders, but you know, you know, you never know. So Steve, I'm gonna turn it to you. One of the things I heard you talk about in terms of transforming Albuquerque sounded like you were doing a lot of listening to the communities that uh, you serve and that the police serve to try to understand how those communities feel about uh, the police and what the police tactics are. I'm going to come from ask you to talk a little bit about that. And then, Ron, when we talked early, early on a few months ago, uh, you had mentioned the feeling of oppression in the minority communities that they felt oppressed. And that's what a lot of this was about. So I'm going to go from Steve, talk a little about what's going on in Albuquerque. And maybe, Ron, you can express some words about uh, how we might listen better to better understand. And then, Pete, you know, all the work that's going on in Seattle that uh, you have done is somewhat inconsistent with the rage of the community in terms of their hostility towards the police. And it's not picking on you. It's just how, how does this all correlate to understanding better how uh, our police are interacting with communities? So Steve, first to you, Ron, then Pete. Uh, thank you, Chuck. So when we, before joining the city and, and 
stepping into this position, I did uh, represent officers and, and uh, other law enforcement entities against uh, the city or other cities. And so I had a different sort of perspective. And one of the things that I that we saw very publicly in November of 2017 was the federal court um, admonishing the prior administration and my predecessor for basically misrepresenting the state, the status of our consent decree and, and the progress that had been made. Um, there was an effort to undermine the independent monitor um, very publicly. Uh, and so involved in that were allegations of doctoring uh, recordings, that recordings were being created and kept and that those were being edited and doctored in a way to make it seem that the monitoring team was uh, not doing the work that it was doing and instead was taking an overly oppressive approach and uh, oh you know we can't we can't get this we can't do this and we can't change that policy because that's going to have an impact here that level of resistance uh, is what uh, the community and myself included was really um, really put really off-putting I mean <clears throat> it was Disheart disheartening. It was absolutely inappropriate, um, but it also enraged the community, um, and it had it's had a huge impact on our ability to restore and to build that trust. Uh, because even from day one coming into this position, um, I think a lot of what we were experiencing in those interactions with those community leaders was a lot of that um, their frustrations, understandably so, with those experiences. Um, it was very hard uh, and it still is in, to some extent to um, help people understand that we are presenting the facts and we're presenting the status of where we're at right now, but that just takes time and that's going to take time to rebuild. You can't just turn on a switch. And so how we have sort of set this up is starting with the way our monitoring progress or process is set up. You'll have a report basically every six months. Um, and we'll get the draft report. And then when it's publicly released by the monitor, we set up um, meetings with those stakeholders in the community. There were public meetings. We were doing them pre-COVID and we're doing them now in the COVID era. Um, and it's, it's the department that, that is, has taken the lead in, in facilitating those. And so they cover all of the elements in those, in the, uh, the CASA and the monitoring reports that uh, really reflect the status of where we're at. It reflects our successes, but it also reflects reflects where we need to improve upon. And that dialogue, um, we're now, I mean, we're, we're, we saw it early on, but now we're really starting to see some of the fruits of that uh, because those community leaders now um, who had been some of the most vocal opponents, right, of the police department before, under, again, understandably so, given their history and the context, they are now, um, I don't want to say full allies, but they understand the work that is going on. And they they work just as hard um, as the members of the police department on addressing issues that are facing our communities, including making actual good thoughtful recommendations on changes to policy, uh, on changes to policing uh, in general. Um, and that, that productive dialogue has, has allowed um, really for some really good work product. Um, you know, we have, it's rare that you have the ACLU saying that we threaded the needle beautifully with our use of force policy, but they did. And, you know, we had lots of different um, examples to work from based upon all the work that, you know, that Pete's done in Seattle and, and a lot of the, the, the teams in New Orleans. But, uh, you know, we have a unique situation and we have a unique, unique community. And I think that's what the real key is, is that every community is going to be different and even segments of the community are all going to be different. They're all going to have different concerns. And so I think at least every six months we are we're sitting in a room, whether it's a virtual room or whether it's the a table at the U.S. Attorney's Office, and we're having a dialogue, and we're having we're having those uncomfortable conversations that have to be had, and that's really key. And it's not shying away from things or not ignoring or acting like we never have had a problem or that a problem doesn't exist. It's really collaborating on how can we transform policing in our communities to provide the best product that we can for both for all of us and so i think that's been very successful ron uh, i mentioned at an earlier time you had talked about uh, the 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 movement 
was trying to address the feeling of oppression in the minority communities. And you know, how can we listen and understand and make changes? Well, that, that that last question, how can you how can you listen and better understand, is perhaps the the hardest one. It it is almost. I speak now not in my capacity as city attorney, but just as a as a citizen of the country. Um, it's hard to figure out how to communicate the level of fear and concern that characterizes the day to day life of a person of color. Uh, you might ask, you know, why my sentiment about that has any value, and I, I think it's a fair question. I mean, I grew up in the segregated South, but I've never lived in an urban ghetto, uh, and still, uh, every interaction I have with uh, law enforcement, or have ever had, uh, is, is characterized by what I think of as an unreasonable degree of fear and concern, not just with the officer in question, but with how others might react to the circumstance. I've been stopped and then grilled for no good reason, but unable to defend myself because of how the corner office partners might have perceived my interaction with this person who took liberties with my rights um, and, and my right to just exist and be where I was. And I think it was probably around 2017, I was up visiting a friend of mine. We went to college together and I was trying to explain to him, you know, that, that somewhere in America right now, there was a person of color uh, who was being abused uh, by a police officer uh, that you could literally characterize every day as a day during which somebody of color was being hunted by a member of the police. And he resisted that argument. And the only thing that bears it out today, an obvious truth to me, is the fact that we have telephones with cameras and videos you can no longer deny. And instance after instance after instance that is put right before you. So, I mean, you literally have to deny your lying eyes um, to not accept that there are profound problems with the way in which people in blue uniforms approach people who are of color. Um, and, you know, it's, it's uh, I, I think there has been uh, an epiphany of, of awareness. I mean, the world's reaction to George Floyd was amazing. The world's reaction, not just the country's. People crossed the Earth said, this should not stand. Uh, so the opportunity there is to, uh, the, the opportunity for folks to um, be receptive to a new message is there. And I think that there are a lot of people who are just opening their ears and, and their eyes. Um, and what's important in order for it to progress beyond just, you know, me bellyaching is to offer um, some real purposeful, and as I like to say, reasoned approaches to a better way. You know, personally, I'm, I'm, I, I think I'm able to balance uh, some of the competing interests. And so, you know, I understand that from time to time, somebody with a gun may need to show up to protect me, right? I just want them to actually protect me and not tackle me before they get on with the business of dealing with the actual criminal at the site. So. I think, uh, you know, that, that certainly points to the concerns. Uh, we were talking a little bit in the break room beforehand of uh, people calling for the police to help when they have a family member in mental health distress and uh, potentially suicidal and rather than uh, leaving the scene with the person protected, the officers leave the scene with the person dead. And um, you know, it, you know, how do we respond? I had a, in my law school, uh, the class I teach, I had a young woman in my class who was white, but living uh, with a family who was black. And she said that when the police responded, 
uh, to calls at that home that they responded completely differently from how they would have responded uh, had they gone to a white home. And I think, you know, uh, they, there are certainly those issues that need to be addressed and we need to understand, you know, how people feel that we can, you know, they, they have that feeling. How do we turn that around? And Pete, I know you're doing a great job in Seattle and, you know, the police department there is amazing. The city's progressive, one of the most progressive cities in the country. And uh, yet at the same time, you have that rage that seems to be underlying what's going on. And I don't know that you have an answer, but what, what are your views? Uh, Chuck, before you move on to sorry, Pete, Ron, can I just yeah. can I share one little talk? Because you, 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 you triggered a thought in my mind. So we lost a police officer last week who showed up at a domestic violence, <clears throat> reported domestic violence event. And he was trying to escort um, a woman woman into her house to recover her belongings and um, there was somebody in in there with a gun who started shooting and killed this man. Uh, he was a near retirement uh, officer, well respected um, as a person as well as as an officer. What was remarkable about this story is that after he got shot, as it relates to what we're talking about, what's remarkable about this story is after he got shot, uh, he was down on the floor bleeding and uh, hurt and a young man went into the, where the apartment was and helped him get out of that area where he was exposed to further risk. But he noted that he had dropped his gun. And so the young man had to go back in and collect the gun. But because he was a thinking young black man, when he picked up that gun, he made sure he wrapped it in a towel so that when he brought it out, he wouldn't be shot. And he handed it to an officer on the scene to take the gun away and told him there's a gun in there. That's the officer's service revolver. I don't think you would have had to do that. I, I'm not sure I would have had the courage to go in either, but, uh... but, but. But my point is, my point is that if you got to think at that level of trying to protect yourself, then that's again, an indicia of the extent of the problem. It, it, well, it, it was is. a question at the debate. I mean, last week, right? We saw it teed up. I mean, that was prominent. Like, how do you have that discussion? You know, right. And and I, I think, you know, before we 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 move to, to Pete, just quickly, I think each and every one of us is supportive of our police officers in the jobs that they do. It's they and in fact I think we all recognize that in many respects, the police have been given a job to do that in some instances, uh, others should be doing. And it's not that we do not support individual police officers or uh, the work of individual police officers or the police in general, it's that there needs to be change and uh, that there may be some individual officers that do not need to be police officers. And that's one of the parts of what change needs to take place. But that's just me talking, but Pete, uh, rather hear it from somebody a lot smarter than me. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm almost reluctant to try and follow uh, the sh personal sharing from Ron because you know the, the truth is I'm a privileged white male and I've never experienced that kind of abuse at the hands of police. I've certainly come across grumpy cops and, and all of that. So I, I do recognize and I do acknowledge that there, there is a difference. And, you know, to, um, we have to own it. I, I, and I wanna say that, you know, the irony, Chuck, as I reflect on my career, you know, police reform has been a centerpiece of my public service. I, you know, I had a career as a private civil litigator um, and my segue into public service, as you pointed out at the outset, was to be appointed to Seattle's very first civilian police oversight board. And it's absolutely true. The reason I, the union went along with my appointment is because I was a white lawyer. What possible harm could I have? Well, I can promise you I will never get a Christmas card from the police union because I brought my training as a lawyer and my eyes you know, with me and, and just 
just could not believe what I saw, the lack of transparency, the inability to hold people accountable, the, 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 the difficulty in penetrating that thin blue, thin blue line. And it didn't win me any, any fans um, in uniform. And that's okay. Because you know, at the end of the day, um, it, it's, it's people like you and me, Chuck, too, that need to speak up forcefully about you know, the kind of, of, of society we want to have, that want to acknowledge uh, where, we're fall, where we're failing all of our citizens. And, and ironically, making our country weaker as a result. You know, we're stronger when we lift everyone up and we treat everyone appropriately. Getting back to the, your question, why what the seemingly disproportionate response, I think your, your words, not mine, uh, in the Seattle streets following George Floyd's murder, um, the, I'll, I'll punt and say the official answer is yet to be determined. That's coming, our inspector general is conducting a sentinel review, incident review, and trying to find out. As you know, our chief of police resigned in the middle of some of the defund debate. Uh, the first female African-American chief of police in Seattle. And, uh, you know, there's a lot going on. Uh, I tell you, you don't say you support Black Lives Matter here and not expect someone to show up and say, so how are you supporting Black Lives Matter? And, you know, council members getting excoriating letters from Black Lives Matter saying, don't, don't mouth sympathy, you know, show us with action. And so I'll close with this. Immediately after that first night, we're seeing downtown Seattle burning and police cars on fire. Um, I had some privileged conversations. I can't discuss who they were with, but it was about that very question, you know. And there was initially a lot of response saying, this is, a, this is the responsibility of a couple of hardcore anarchist agitators out of Portland or something like that. And all I could say was, God, those guys get around. They were in 40 cities last night. How can that be? This is something much more visceral. This is something much more profound. This is something that's not going to go away. And that was my confidential remarks early on after the first day of what I saw in our streets here. And I hate to be proven correct on that, but I think that the takeaway is that this is not going to go away. And the inconvenience that you know, the Proud Boys or the Trump administration can take some comfort in it and try to use it to sow further seeds of fear that you know, your cities are gonna become anarchist jurisdictions if you, if, you, if you listen to any of this, is something that, you know, that, that moment in history, when it comes, it comes. And we're either here and ready for it or we're not. And that's why I think this is an exciting time. It's a scary time. One of these days, I hope to be able to sleep through one night without you know, worrying about it. But I think we're on, the, we're on the brink here of potentially terrific, immense breakthrough that's been only about 400 years overdue. So uh, I, I remain optimistic and hopeful, but just God knows there's so much work to do. We just have about two minutes left. Any closing remarks? I gave mine. Jim? <laughs> really quickly, um, as Pete was speaking, I was just reminded of, um, because of some of the work we've been doing, I've gone back to read the Kerner Commission report. And one of the themes in that report was debunking the idea that there were outside agitators that were causing the trouble. Um, in all of the cities that had been erupting across the United States in 1967 and 68. And often when you hear that, it says more about um, the disconnect between those who are articulating that view and actually what's going on. Um, and this is an opportunity, as, as Chuck, you were emphasizing, for us to really deeply listen to each other. And this is a moment, you know, every generation or so there's a, a moment when things start to come together and we can we can help create an inflection point and I think we're in that moment and the fact that all of us are engaged in this way is a reason for us to to be hopeful but it is even though King said the arc of the universe bends um, uh, towards justice um, I think we have to pull on it and this is our moment to pull 
It's a great concluding statement. Uh, I want to thank all of you. Uh, obviously, each and every one of you is a very busy person, and you've given up an hour and a half of your time uh, today, as well as some time earlier to prepare for this. Thank you so much. It's been, uh, I think, a very productive discussion. I want to thank you for it, and let's hope we can continue it. And uh, for some of you, I, I think it, not everyone on the call, but uh, for our presenters here now, I'll see you uh, Friday for another session that we're going to have. All right. Thank you all. Appreciate thank you. it. Well, take care.